Good morning. We are calling to order Commission Meeting Number 284 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, December 19th, 2019, at 10 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. Um, before we get started, I want to explain that for those who need the service, our closed captioning um, technology is not working right now. We are going to try to establish that service. We are still streaming live, and we are, of course, taking our minutes. Uh, <clears throat> we will, uh, as I said, continue to try to get that service going. Item number two on our agenda, our minutes. Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the packet, you have the minutes from our December 5th, 2019 commission meeting. Uh, I would move their approval, subject to correction for typographical errors and uh, other non-material matters. I would also like to suggest striking the last sentence in the first paragraph under the 10.59 a.m. Uh, portion of the meeting on page 3. Uh, we'll go back and see if we can reword that, but for the time being, we should strike that last sentence in the first paragraph. Second. Any further discussion? I'll be abstaining, Madam Chair, as I was not present in that meeting. That's right. So thank you, Commissioner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Four in favor, one abstention. Thank you. Just as an alert on today's agenda, we have um, several matters, and we do have uh, external guests arriving who have some very strict timelines. I'll monitor the time carefully today. There might be some slight shifting in agenda item, um, items. Moving on to the, our administrative update, Director Bedrosian. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. A couple of items. Um, first, uh, I think you're aware that there is a posting for a general counsel uh, position that is out there publicly um, that we put out right before the holidays, and we did get um, a bunch of qualified uh, responders. Having said that, um, I'm going to recommend, um, I think I'm going to pull the posting right now and repost at the beginning of the year in order to uh, engage in a process that's more coordinated. I think I also want to be up not during the holidays um, to see uh, what we might attract in terms of uh, applicants and then in a process where we could go potentially right into uh, interviews. In fairness to the people who have applied, we will send them a letter letting them know that and letting them know that they will automatically, if they meet the minimum requirements, be considered in the new posting when it comes up. They might have moved on, they might not, or, but, but we'll obviously do that in fairness to those folks. So uh, I'd like to, I'm just letting you know I'm going to do that. Okay. Perhaps it, um, we should mention that uh, Mr. Todd Grossman has been functioning as the interim uh, counsel. Is that? Um, he has, statement? as an interim general counsel, and, I, and the other thing I would say is we are being served very well right now. The commission and, and uh, not only Todd, but uh, the associate general counsels are, are serving the commission very well. So I feel like the commission's legal needs are being met uh, more than appropriately. I would agree with that. Okay. And, and we appreciate everyone stepping up to the plate. Thank you to the legal team and, and to Todd's leadership. Great. So uh, the next thing is I'm going to combine. Um, we did have a staff meeting last week. Um, it was a good time for uh, the commission and employees to gather together um, to celebrate the holidays, talk about um, events that happened in the past year. And two, two things uh, of note. One was the uh, all-important Yankee swap. Um, uh, the gifts this year were very interesting, including uh, I'm get my, my, my socks. Yes, my, well done. My, uh, well done, exactly. yes. <laughs> exactly. So if you want to know, if the public wants to know what they missed, uh, it was a great pair of socks. Um, more importantly, though, it was also a celebration of a longtime employee um, who is leaving us today, who I can see with my eyes in the back of my head is cringing in the back of the room right now. Um, she does not like to be the center of attention. Um, she has always somewhat existed in the background for us. Um, and of course, you know, I'm talking about Janice Riley, who is retiring today. 
Janice has had many titles here. Uh, first, she was Chief of Staff to the Commission. Next, she was Chief Administrative Officer. She also holds title employee number one for the Commission. Um, but most importantly, um, Janice literally was the backbone of the Commission, uh, both in the time I was here and I know from stories and, and talking to you all and also uh, interacting with the Commission when I was at the AG's office, um, that quite frankly, the Commission probably wouldn't be where it is today without Janice's early expertise in securing office space and just knowing people and getting things done. Um, she has done this in a way um, that I think was reflected uh, very well in the Commission's decision um, to give her the uh, McHugh Award at our staff meeting. And just as you all know, but to remind the public, uh, the McHugh Award is an award that is given to an employee each year um, honoring a commission employee whose public service best represents the values of former Commissioner Jim McHugh. Those values are wisdom, intellectual integrity, fidelity to law, human decency, and humor. And um, I couldn't think of a, a more apt person to got that award this year than, than Ms. Riley. Um, she will be um, missed, not only because she literally knows everything, um, but she will be missed because she does her job with a sense of purpose and humor um, and uh, sort of, uh, I would say, scope and keeping us all in our place um, that has been invaluable for us. And she just knows things um, and has peripheral vision and anticipates things that um, many of us, including myself, would, would never have thought of. Um, so, and, and she just does it with a sense of, of decency, not only as we do our jobs internally, but both what the public is viewing, how the public is viewing us, and how we should, how we should treat people and how, how people should treat us also. Um, so um, she will be um, missed. Our retirement is well deserved, um, and um, from my tenure, she has been an invaluable partner um, in, in helping, uh, I think, staff be successful. So um, I know, uh, Commissioner, you may want to say something at the appropriate time, but um, all I can say is, uh, Janice, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I just I just want to emphasize a little bit of what you already said. Uh, there were uh, many job descriptions, many um, activities that Janice undertook, uh, but uh, not in any one of those job descriptions uh, was really the the task of troubleshooting and problem solving and um, and uh, stepping up to the plate when the situation merited it and. Um, and that is a really important quality that we are going to miss, Janice, and, and uh, value all of your contributions. And if, if you don't mind, because of our agenda, um, we will reserve our comments until a little bit later in the okay. meeting because of our guests. Because I think we don't want to have to shortcut any of our comments for Ms. Riley, so thank you. Um, but, uh, but most importantly, Ed, so well said, and uh, my only regret is that somehow Austin wasn't able to hand over to Janice's expression somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so Janice, um, uh, because that Janice, might is be a our, good thing. Janice is our timekeeper expert um, and has already started to shift that role, I'm going to do what Janice has told me to do and stick to our, our agenda. So Ed, do you have any further? I do not. Thank okay, you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we, we now have appear to have the closed caption. Oh, it has come on. Thank you, Thanks Commissioner you. Zuniga. And thank you, Austin, and the team who has been able to accomplish that. Great. We have our, our closed caption services going on. Moving on to item number four. Um, this is uh, Director Wells, please, and our Chief Enforcement Counsel, um, Loretta um, 
Nothing else, and I see that Director Griffin has joined the table. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, on the agenda today is a follow-up from uh, an agenda item we had uh, two meetings ago, approximately four weeks ago, on uh, just the IEB seeking some clarification of Regulation 205 CMR 134.09. This is just to frame the issue again is uh, the uh, commission had uh, promulgated a regulation about uh, what the, the uh, investigations and enforcement bureau should do regarding the uh, records that have been sealed as part of a proceeding in court and we're looking for clarification on whether that is limited to the actual records themselves in the court or all information about that incident. Um, the uh, reg itself is somewhat ambiguous for that and we would like some clarification from the Commission on the intent. Uh, it may be that we want to, uh, as a result of this conversation or for other conversations, follow up and clarify the reg. I think that would be my recommendation. Uh, so uh, we've already had somewhat of a substantive conversation on what the issue is. Part of the uh, reason for the agenda item today was the Commission had asked for feedback from community groups, community members on some uh, uh, insight they may have so we can be further informed of A, the potential impact of this and B, how the, the community just reacts to the record, uh, pardon me, the sealing of the records issue. So I believe uh, Director Griffin is going to go over uh, some responses we got from Unite Here, Action for Equity, and the Greater Boston Legal Services. In addition, we, uh, there was also a request from uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I think the, the Commission agreed on that, uh, just to have some further explanation on the difference between expunged records and sealed records and the law on that. So uh, Chief Enforcement Counsel, my deputy, Loretta Lilios, is prepared to speak on that. Uh, so I'll defer to the Chair on, on the order, but I would suggest we probably have Director Griffin go forward with the comments from the uh, community groups, and then we can go into the law, which uh, uh, this is, or Deputy Director Lilios can further explain. So. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as um, Director Wells mentioned, we received um, three letters regarding this matter. Um, Brian Lang, president of Unite Here Local 26, wrote, um, we ask that the Massachusetts Gaming Commission do everything in its power to enact a policy to ensure that there is no use of information under any circumstance that led to a criminal case which was later sealed in determining suitability of job applicants at the Massachusetts gaming facilities. Um, and I'm reading excerpts because you have the full letter in your uh, folder, but he further writes, a policy banning the use of such information should be enacted by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to confirm the spirit and intention of both, both 205 CMR 134 and Mass General Law uh, 23K and put a stop to any interpretation which would be harmful to the Massachusetts workforce. Um, Paula um, Quirion, director of the Corey and Reentry Project at the Greater Boston Legal Services, um, apologize, she is actually in court right now, um, otherwise she would have been here, but she indicated that the Gaming Commission should comply with the spirit and letter of the law that bars the use of sealed records in hiring determinations. Permit, permitting investigators to search for and report on facts underlying a sealed record would eviscerate the benefits of sealing the record in the shorter sealing waiting periods as enacted by the legislature. The shorter waiting periods are consistent with studies showing that as time passes, the risk of reoffending for people with a criminal history approaches the same risk is that of people without records committing a crime. Um, she makes the point that opening a back door to sealed quarry will have a racially disparate impact on applicants um, of color for um, casino and gaming positions. Um, and um, the Next letter that we received was from the Job Action Network, um, also the Action for Regional Equity, um, 
they stand firmly opposed to using open source information related to a sealed record as a basis for disqualifying anyone from being licensed by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Sealing records processes already require an evaluation of the seriousness and risk. The most egregious crimes are not eligible for sealing. Um, they further make a point that using records of any sort related to a sealed record is a way around a legal procedure. Um, and um, that open source records have not been evaluated for accuracy. Um, this letter is signed by La Community La Comunidad, Chelsea Collaborative, New England United for Justice, Action for Regional Equity, the Roxbury Good Job Standards and Community Stabilization. So um, those letters are included in your packet in full. Are there, are there any questions for Director Griffin on the letter? Is there any further clarification required by the commission? I just want to thank uh, the, those who did uh, supply those comments to us. Very, very helpful, um, important input for us. So we very much appreciate uh, that uh, stakeholders do participate in this process. We are public by mandate, and that can sometimes be difficult, but when we get this kind of input, I truly appreciate the fact that we are appearing, you know, at least bi-weekly in a public forum and that we have that kind of input, so thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Lilios just to give an overview of the difference between expungement and sealed records. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. So I know we touched on uh, this uh, matter between sealing and expungement a little bit at the last meeting, and there is a very brief note in the October 3rd memo in your packet, uh, but I'm prepared to give a little bit more background and uh, delve into the distinctions in the provisions uh, now. Uh, as you know, and as is touched on in the memo in the packet, the commission previously in connection with a racing case determined that the purpose of ex expungement indicated that uh, the matter should be treated by the commission as if the incident never occurred. So th this is, I think, some of the background uh, that you, why you're looking at this matter. So by way of review, when we met, uh, when you met last time, we talked about the two types of uh, sealing uh, avenues that individuals can uh, take to have their uh, criminal records sealed. And there's administrative sealing and then there is court-ordered sealing. Uh, the administrative sealing applies to criminal convictions uh, only. And it's an administrative matter, it never goes to a court. And that provision, uh, which is 276 section 100A, uh, says that a person, um, if the person satisfies the timelines in the statute, so a misdemeanor conviction would have had to have been uh, wrapped up three years prior to a request, felony conviction wrapped up seven years prior to a request, no intervening uh, issues with arrests, um, and of course some, uh, some crimes uh, excluded and not eligible for this. But if you meet those timeline provisions, you're entitled to the ceiling. Sealing does not destroy a record. Those records continue to exist and they are used by courts for sentencing purposes if the individual uh, is convicted of a, of a subsequent uh, crime. And they are uh, available as well to law enforcement agencies. Court ordered sealing, the result is the same. The records are not destroyed. They apply only to the court and probation records. It does not extend to records in the public realm and uh, people go to court for sealing of records in non-conviction matters uh, that may have resulted in dismissals, findings of not guilty, uh, no bills from grand juries or you, when the grand jury determines not to uh, indict. A petition is made uh, to the court. It's ex parte in the sense that the district attorney is not entitled to notification and is not notified. <laughs> Uh, the court makes specific findings um, 
uh, and the result is the same as the sealing of convicted records. Expungement stands on different footing. Uh, by statutory definition, expungement is the permanent erasure or destruction of a record so the record is no longer accessible to or maintained by the court. There are, again, eligibility requirements, some exclusions for certain crimes. The process is very different than for the sealing of records. An individual must make a petition uh, to the commissioner of probation. If the commissioner determines that the uh, crime is eligible uh, for expungement, um, it, the commissioner notifies the district attorney. The district attorney uh, has the opportunity to file a written objection, and if the district attorney objects, the matter is scheduled for a hearing, and both sides have the opportunity uh, to, be, to be heard. Uh, the court then has the discretion whether to grant or deny based on the interests of justice, and the individual has the burden of showing by clear and convincing evidence any number uh, uh, of items listed in that statute. And that list is comprised of things like it was a matter of false identification. Uh, there was a fraud perpetrated upon the court. There was gross police misconduct or gross misconduct by the court. So uh, one of the aspects of expungement is that the um, integrity of the criminal charge or conviction itself is called into question. That is not the case with sealed records. The sealed records, there's no assault on the integrity of the charge or conviction. Uh, but many of the factors um, allowing somebody to have an expunged record go to the core of the integrity of the actual charge. Um, if expunged, the, the expungement order goes to the court and to probation. Uh, all of those records maintained also goes to the public facing records for police departments like their uh, public facing <coughs> police uh, logs. Um, so our commission is not responsible, obviously, for carrying out uh, the sealing or expungement requests uh, or orders. Those are handled by a court or uh, other agency. Um, in a nutshell, those are the distinctions that I, I thought were mo would be most useful to you in this process. I, I have a question, uh, Loretta. Um, in the case of expungement, um, does it matter if there has been a conviction or not? It can apply uh, it to, to non-convictions as well. And uh, in the case of court order sealing of the records, um, that applies to non-convictions only, correct? Correct. Um, what is the eligibility? Uh, I'm sorry? The mm -hmm. court ordered sealing is non-convictions. Correct. Convictions yeah. may be sealed as an administrative matter yes. outside of the court. Yes. So I'm talking about court order sealing uh, of, of records. So those are only on non-convictions. Um, what's the eligibility, if any? What's the eligibility for, um, <coughs> is everybody eligible? Because uh, they were never convicted. Certain crimes are uh, excluded, uh, certain firearm offenses, certain uh, sexual assault offenses. I think there may be some offenses. We, we talked about the three year, seven year breakdown. I actually think there may be some that are 15 year um, look back window. Um, but they don't necessarily parallel the administrative ceiling. I believe they do, I believe they do parallel the. the the administrative ceiling. Now, okay. again, I, I did not uh, peel back every layer of the yeah. eligibility requirements because we don't. Um, We're not administering. We them. don't administer mm -hmm. uh, or those. Right. Thank you. So, one of the things that I think we would all benefit from too is going through um, sort of the actual process in terms of how open source materials and information on a potentially sealed record comes into the hands of the investigators. Some of the filings almost imply that there was um, almost a deliberate effort to seek some of this information. And I think there needs to be clarity that the way this happens is yeah. you're conducting your due diligence on some suitability. Information comes through open sources. And then there's a question where you cross-reference, because you do have access to the sealed as a law enforcement agency, Correct. to then determine we need to 
silo this off. And I think there needs to be a discussion on how that works and then how anything that open source is then connected to a sealed document is then segregated and retained because I think that will probably inform some of the things that I want to talk about in terms of how we address this question. Right. So um, in terms of the process, it is not uh, as if the investigator sees, oh, there's a sealed record. I'm going to go find out all I can about that. That's not the uh, direction that the IEB has given to investigators. However, when investigators do, they have a series of, of uh, steps that they can do in an investigation. One is an open source search. They can also look at uh, different uh, law enforcement databases. So if they're doing these things in parallel, you, an investigator may get information. So hypothetically, you've got uh, someone that was convicted of B&E in a nighttime, and that record was sealed because it's more than seven years old. But an open source search might reveal information about many breaks in that neighborhood during a time period and all that, and the name may, might be right out there. So the investigator knows it. Uh, the process we're going to have to talk about is if the, if the commission goes to the um, interpretation that these, uh, uh, the information that's found, whether through a database or open source, or sometimes we have individuals that just are talking to the investigator and disclose. And it, I would parallel that to a situation where you have a criminal prosecution where certain evidence is suppressed. Mm -hmm. So we would, in that case, if we had information about a, a sealed record, when that um, individual hypothetically is considered whether or not there, there may be some other information, we consider whether or not that, uh, that registration should be revoked or the license should be denied. What we would have to do as part of the process is segregate that information, and that cannot be considered as part of the record for making a determination on suitability. It would be as if a prosecutor is evaluating a case and information was suppressed. So say a confession was suppressed or drugs in a search warrant were suppressed. And then you look at the rest of the evidence, and then we make a determination. If we go through this process, do we have sufficient evidence based on the standards that the commission has set? And the two uh, important ones are, one, the burdens on the applicant to show by clear and convincing evidence their suitability, but also we have to look at evidence in the most favorable light to the applicant. So in doing that evaluation, we're also looking at, in it, with the lens, this person appeals. The, the, everyone who has uh, had their license, their, uh, their, uh, pardon me, their uh, registration revoked or their license denied has the right to an appeal to a hearing officer and the right to an appeal to the commission. So we're thinking in terms of if you're putting that case together, we cannot use that evidence in the uh, uh, presentation that we would make to the hearing officer and then ultimately that information would go up to the commission. So we would still have it in the file as far, you know, because we run all the stuff and keep the records because we're required to keep things as part of the, um, of, of the process, but we would not be able to use that against the applicant. Director Wells, is that the current practice? Generally, yes. We really haven't had, I mean, this question came up more in the theoretical. We have not been using information from sealed records to, in order to deny licenses or revoke registrations. We are bringing this forward not to ask for it, but we noted that there, you know, this may come up, and this is something we'd rather know on the front end what the Commission's policy directive is rather than go through the process and have someone be a test case because that's a human being and that's you know their job. So we'd rather know on the front end how this is going to work should it go through the process of an appeal. So one of the, the reason that I asked is that, and I in the briefings and how we talked about it the last time, is there is a tension between um, the intent and the purpose of the sealing statute and the statutory mandate that this agency has as a law enforcement agency to vet the suitability. And so there has to be some sort of equilibrium between the tensions of those two statutes. And my inclination is there are gradations of job responsibilities and access to in terms of the gaming establishments. There's already been a, a section of jobs, a number of jobs that have been removed from the licensing requirement where that assessment was made and the, even the process itself was deemed uh, immaterial. Right. I want to have a conversation about, and I realize Ms. Lewis and I have had this conversation where there might you know, be nuances to how this would be effectuated, but when you get up to the top tier candidates, I don't want 
this commission to be in a situation where they don't have all the information available to them. And so I want to talk about whether there is a process whereby, you know, the entry level licensing requirements is treated with, you're not going to look at that, we're giving opportunities to people to go into the workforce, you're complying with the sort of spirit of the ceiling record. Versus when you go up the chain and maybe now your responsibilities have changed and now you're in a position where you have a lot more access to financial information, financial documents, things like that are more sensitive. And is there a way to tier it so that the more sensitive positions are treated in a way with any information lawfully available to the commission as a law enforcement agency compared to sort of the intent of the ceiling statute and the gaming act of getting people in and employment opportunities? Uh, so I have a few comments that may be helpful. So first of all, I think it's important to keep in mind how rare this is even across the board, which doesn't mean we don't need your direction because as, uh, you know, even if it's one person and the exposure that we have is that we must be consistent and we must have a procedure and must have a protocol. So it's rare across the board. It will be even rarer as you reach the highest levels because those are individuals that have, especially at the key executive level, have often been licensed in other jurisdictions before. So we get even even um, less uh, frequent uh, as, as you go up. Um, the types of things we'd have to think about if we tiered, and the top tier are the keys and they are two levels within the key, it's a key standard and a key executive. Um, we are already under the mandate by regulation to evaluate the data that we have according to the job responsibilities of the position at hand. Uh, the positions are not consistent across the three casinos, so we would Need, and they change, the job responsibilities for the positions change, so we would need to really stay on top of that. Um, and another factor that we need to consider is if there are promotions from one level where you may suggest that we not utilize this outside information into a position, a key position where you know, we you will allow us to uh, look at it, we'd need to have a way of going back in um, and assessing in light of the higher level position whether it's now something uh, relevant. So those are some of the, uh, some of the areas um, if you want to add to that. No, I think that uh, just a matter of practice at that key executive level, I would be shocked if we had this situation occur in, at that level, key standard, extremely unlikely and then as you go down you know the um, uh, down the chain of the license levels it potentially more likely but um, certainly not likely at the key executive level the, the question would be that key standard level particularly in as uh, Ms. Lilios pointed out we the, the casino industry we've seen there's lots of opportunity for promotion so someone could start out in the uh, at one of the casinos as a licensed GEL. However, do a really good job and then move up to that key standard position. So for example, they might be a security guard, which it needs to be licensed as a gaming employee. That person might do very well and they might want to promote that person to a supervisor. We're then in a little bit of a tricky situation if that's the cutoff, you know, key versus non-key all of a sudden we're doing another evaluation and that person may have worked there for a while and now we're potentially looking at information surrounding a sealed record. So it's tricky at what point could you make that cutoff. That would, um, that potentially could be operationally somewhat of a challenge, but you know, it would depend on what the, you know, the intent of the commission's, um, you know, directive on the, the level of licensure and where it matters. Just jump in here. Um, first of all, I think it's a very positive sign that IEB has come to us looking for direction because they want to get it right. They, they are looking for clarification and don't want to be in a situation where they're maybe um, performing an investigative function that they don't know how we feel about that. So I think that's a real positive step. Secondly, um, 
I have seen no evidence that IEB has misused information or has treated people differently. Um, uh, you know, the investigations that I've seen, and we've seen a number of them, have been done very professionally and using information in an appropriate way. Having said that, um, I was, I found the letters compelling. I found um, um, the intent of the law here and what really, um, we're talking about employment. We are not talking about a court proceeding in which those sealed records um, are, are appropriate use for those sealed records would be a, a court proceeding in which another violation is alleged, another, another crime is alleged. Um, for employment purposes, um, I, I believe the, uh, the intent of this law is to keep that material out. And I believe it's been vetted, whether it be administratively or in a court process, and um, the time frames are appropriate. Um, I do not want this commission to be in a situation where um, it appears we're looking for an end run, and I don't think that's what the intent was here at all. The intent is clarification. I agree with um, uh, Director Wells that our reg needs clarification. And I'm really, um, again, I, I think it's a real positive when investigators come back and say, hey, we don't want to make a mistake. How should be, we be utilizing this information? Um, also, the issue of disparate treatment. I mean, that's one of the reasons these records um, uh, were sealed in the first place and you know the accuracy of open source information i found all of that compelling and i um i certainly am leaning toward keeping all that information out for these employment purposes i was persuaded also by the very little risk of the higher level position um using that information there and also you know the the, the information about people getting promoted um that's actually a really good thing so they've dem they've maybe made a mistake early in their life, they started at a lower level, they've earned the respect and trust, and now they're getting promoted. To me, that's a really positive thing. And I don't look at it as a risk to us um, to, to move forward in that direction, because they've demonstrated that they're trustworthy and, um, and uh, you know, they're capable and willing and want that promotion. So I don't, and I, your comments about what is what is risk? That's how we would like to regulate, right? We were just assessing risk. So I, for one, am uh, looking at keeping this information out, which I do believe is the intent. I just want to make clear, I don't think that on its face, should we choose to use it, we are in violation of the statute. I actually disagree. There's, that's why I wanted the distinction between expungement and sealing. If the decision is to use it, I respectfully disagree. We're not violating the statute. I, now, in letter, spirit, maybe, but in terms of the letter of the law, I don't think it is. Now, having said that, um, I do think that there is a way to balance the risk. I'm not 100% convinced that when you get to the top, there might not be that unusual case. And I don't necessarily want to hamstring us. Different question in terms of assessment of the potential yeah. of risk or the severity of that risk. But I'm not convinced it doesn't exist at all when you get up to that level. Well, I, I agree with you, Commissioner Cameron. I, uh, uh, you know, for all, for all those reasons, um, I, uh, I was actually initially thinking that the regulation pointed us already in the direction of not considering them, but I recognize the need to clarify it, mm -hmm. however little we may come up with this in the future. And, um, and I think um, the organizations that took the time to respond made the points that I wanted to make uh, 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 a lot more elegant and clear, in my opinion, than I would have. Um, the backdoor notion, uh, the disproportionate effect that these would effectively have on uh, certain populations, especially minorities, um, is a reality that we have to also balance. Um, and uh, the, the spirit of, of the statute, there's, there's enough, the statute in, in the case of the sealing of the records, uh, I think there's enough parallels with our own statute, uh, the ability of prove um, uh, uh, a rehabilitation after some period of time, okay, they, they don't necessarily align in, 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 uh, in exact years, uh, 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 but I think uh, that's a principle that we must recognize. I think we have 
It's true that we are a, a, a law enforcement agency, but when it comes to occupational licenses, dealing cards or being a, a security officer, uh, a security person in the, in the casino, emulates in my mind a lot more of what uh, uh, the, the, the statute intended for the sealing of the records on other occupational licenses, being a nurse or, or a health uh, worker. Um, so I think, um, I think also that it's important to point out that we have um, access to a lot more information than any other employer, and that including access to the sealing records themselves, and that carries with itself a responsibility, I think, um, to use it judiciously. Um, we have um, a number of other instances. Uh, the, the whole principle of the, um, the, um, the, the forms uh, that are required um, hinge on the notion of over and self-disclosure. Um, and, and with that in mind, uh, I, I submit that we have a lot of access uh, compared to other, uh, other employers, um, when it, even though we're not employers necessarily in this instance, uh, have for making employment or licensure determinations. So I, I would be in favor of clarifying the regulation uh, that is currently um, written the way it is to, to clarify that it is any information or information related to the incident around or however many incidents are sealed, uh, however we obtain it, um, and consider any other information uh, like, we, like we have um, that is not related to, to, to the sealed um, incidents. Commissioner. Yeah, I would uh, uh, echo some of the comments that Commissioner Cameron made and Commissioner Zuniga just made. Um, I think where I find myself from the last time we had this discussion did a little deeper dive into the actual sealing process. Uh, and even though, as you pointed out, that isn't up to us, uh, I got more comfortable with the process and, and the process that somebody goes through to have their record sealed. You know, I, I do know uh, Commissioner O'Brien's note about it'd be great if the ceiling for a felony kind of nicely aligned with, you know, our 10-year kind of prohibition, but it doesn't, and obviously chances of going back into 23K and getting the change to make an align is probably not going to happen. Um, uh, you know, again, the intent of sealing records is to give an individual a second chance. They certainly can't get it sealed if they've had other intervening events happen um, in that seven-year window, that three-year window. Um, so I also agree that, you know, the open source information, again, if it's tied to the sealed case, should not be considered. Um, Kind of going forward, the things that I'd like for us to think about, uh, and this gets to, again, how do we communicate this message out to individuals considering employment uh, or taking the step of getting their record sealed? I know we've talked about the application. I think the application is much more clear on this question, but something we should remain attentive to is people, you know, question what it says. I think we've done a good job at that. Um, at one point, we had a, a fact sheet. I don't know if you've updated that recently, but um, the original one we rolled out a while back probably still had the restrictions against some of the gaming service employee information on it. If it hasn't, we should update that because I think that'd be a, a great tool for some of our partners to use in talking about this with folks in the community. Um, and I want to be sure that if we agree this is our policy, that it continues to be our policy and that it doesn't fluctuate, not suggesting, any, suggesting anything, but if one or two, both of you are no longer at the IB, we do want to have some consistency in the policy um, and how it's enforced. And let's set a time to kind of come back and report back to us, you know, I think we're mindful of where this might apply to a promotional case. And I think we've speculated that we may not see a huge number of cases related to that, but coming back at some intervening time period to just let us know what 
if we're bumping up against some of those questions or some of those challenges. Well, I think that our discussion today uh, does demonstrate what I started with, was how important it was to get information from key stakeholders in this discussion. And I encourage others to continue to provide that, that information. I would echo um, <clears throat> truly um, the comments made by Commissioner Cameron and by uh, Commissioner Zuniga. I am a believer in second chances, and our law has evolved in a way that supports that. But we know as regulators that our humanity can't always dictate our actions, that sometimes we have to make tough choices. But Commissioner Zuniga said it very well. We have access to information that our employers, our licensees don't have, and we have to use that information judiciously. <clears throat> I would support really a practice that is reflected probably not artfully or, or clearly enough in our current regulation and not use information that pertains to a sealed record in these employment matters. With that said, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if we have a 100% consensus, so I'm looking to you, Director Wells, as to how you would like to proceed. We did reserve an opportunity for a vote today. If you would like to come back with options on, reg on language for the regulation to clarify that so that we could have a more formal vote, well, I welcome that. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm thinking as I'm listening to all of this is maybe uh, for the, either the next meeting or the meeting thereafter, we can work with the legal department and draft sort of both <coughs> options that have been put on the table. It sounds as if no one on the commission is looking for this informa potential information to be used at the service level or GEL level. So that gives us direction, even just because there's a public uh, discussion about that. So we can use that going forward, that no one on the commission is saying we want information from a sealed record, um, underlying conduct to be available for those lower level employees. So we're good on that. So it seems as if the only point of uh, further discussion would be on either the key standard or the key executive level uh, and what I think we could do is work with the legal department, maybe draft language which would keep it out entirely, draft language that would uh, have it be uh, uh, prohibited at those lower levels, and then the commission could vote at that time and we move forward through the promulgation process to deal with that issue. Does that seem like Well, well to, uh, to, to be clear, I, I, was, I am of the opinion that it not be considered for anybody. To right. give you right. so we've and I am as well. Uh, yeah. to, you know, to give and, to give and I think so we have at least three of the five of us who are right. suggesting that there is So it's up to you whether you want just one on to keep it out and I, I have a there? suggestion uh, to modify whether we vote in or not, but I think the regulation the way it's currently written could be well served to at least the way I um, intended, which is simply changing the any information that appears at the closer to the acts of delinquency mm -hmm. and putting that at the beginning to ensure that it covers records and delinquency um, you know, shall not be considered. Um, you know what I mean by, uh, by my edit? I, I think it needs to be altered more than that though because records in that context I think is more of a term of art that would still restrict you to the court file and the probation file. And I think what you've expressed is an intent to block open source use as well. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it needs to be reworded beyond that to actually capture what you're hoping to do. That's fair enough. I mean, I was, I was in, in my suggestion, I was saying any information would apply to however it's obtained. But, but I think it's important enough to, I think, I think to, it, to make I sure. I think it merits maybe talking with IBS right. so council having a conversation right. to make sure they're actually right. capturing what you're talking about. But I don't want the commission to be concerned in the interim we're going to go do something with, you know, we get no, the message no, I, and I, we'll actually. just, uh, you know, work accordingly with the commission's uh, clear policy directive here. But I do think clarifying the reg is important so that we have some consistency down the road um, and that there's, there's no confusion on that. So, I mean, I'm comfortable. We, I don't think we need a particular vote on any kind of language. I'm comfortable that we understand what the commission is saying and then uh, we can work with legal and just bring that up at the next meeting if that works for you. That works, yeah. I think. 
Okay. I think that that makes sense rather than a vote today. Okay. okay. Are you comfortable? Good. Okay. Very helpful. And again, thank you to all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need to take a two-minute break. Uh, we are two minutes ahead, but I am respectful of all needs of my fellow commissioners. Thank you. Good. We're, recon we're reconvening, meeting, um, uh, what's our number today, uh, 284, and we are now turning to item number five on our busy agenda. That would be back to Executive Director Bedrosian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. This is a follow-up agenda item from our last meeting. Um, I hope you will remember uh, I think during the last meeting when we discussed uh, the best vehicles uh, if the Commission wanted further input on um, Region C items um, that there seemed to be two different vehicles one was a traditional public comment and another was uh, an RFI and uh, just for clarification you have in the packet today a number of items including the materials um, from our previous meeting, uh, a uh, updated um, memo from staff and a recent letter we just got in from um, the current mayor of Brockton. Uh, and in, in the memo from staff, um, we want to clarify, you know, for some folks who aren't used to what an RFI is, um, at least how OSD, Operational Services Division, thinks about an RFI. Um, we pulled from the best value procurement a handbook which is updated this last August um, how they think of an RFI and to be clear they um, uh, think it's they, they say RFIs traditionally are used to identify industry standards best practices potential for performance measures and price structures uh, so with that guidance uh, what staff did is um, suggest um, sort of two buckets of questions that uh, could help inform the Commission about how it thinks about um, the Region C. Um, the public comment questions uh, start very broadly, as you will see. Um, something that says, should the Commission consider reopening Region C? That obviously is an incredibly broad question, and you can imagine the type of public response that would be a broad public response. Um, then we get down a little more. We get a little more um, organic as we go down the list about specific items. Um, I think we think of public comment questions as being more policy-based. Um, so, uh, and then um, the request for RFI questions um, with the guidance from the OSD division, we hoped were more metric-based and performance or market-based in terms of uh, the, the request would be for the professionals out there to give some guidance to the best way to engage potentially a market study. When would it be? What are the factors? Um, those types of things before, and again, I, I, this is in the memo and I've said it before, an RFI presupposes but does not require a mark in a, a eventual RFP or an RFR. Um, uh, but the the questions were geared towards um, getting responses that would help inform the best way to subsequently do that if the commission so decided. 
Um, so the other thing is we, I did ask that this be listed for a vote. I don't think it necessarily needs to be a vote, but if the commission um, felt uh, uh, compelled, um, there's certainly that option. So um, having said that, oh, and of course, as I said, uh, there are some, there are the uh, uh, attachments, which is the recent letter from the current mayor of Brockton and the previous materials. So I don't know if you have any questions of, of me and the, or just acting general counsel. Just real quickly, the, the letter from the acting mayor Brockton, when did we get it? But there's no date on it. Oh, I apologize. So um, two days ago, I can tell you for sure. Give me one sec. I can tell you for sure. Um, I received it in an email. Um, I am pretty sure it was two days ago. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was uh, it was Monday afternoon. Yeah, um, it was Monday. Yes. And that's okay. the receipt date. That is the receipt date to me on okay. an email. Yes. Well, I just think it's um, it's important to listen to everyone, including the the. Um, uh, the present mayor, but I think it's also important to point out that there will be a new mayor in January, and we have no idea um, how that um, new mayor will feel about this topic. I'm su I suspect we'll know in short order. Um, we did have uh, an applicant that the administration changed, and um, the, the new team coming in was not in favor of that applicant. So that. Um, uh, that has already occurred within this commission, so I think it's important to note that uh, uh, that would be important information moving forward that there will be a new administration next month. Um, I, the, the, I, I agree with that. I, um, I have an, a couple of comments. Uh, sure. I realize maybe some of what I will point out could have been made when I was absent last time around. Um, but uh, I, I, I want to at least um, state for the record a couple of things. Um, I, I think the memo is very helpful. I have one, um, one of the bullet points here, the one about whether to engage in a gaming market study. Um, strikes to me that is, it would be better suited for the RFI process. I, I don't think it hurts to ask the public or anybody in the public uh, about that. Uh, mostly because I have some ideas uh, to make uh, around conducting uh, a new market study um, in more detail that I want to talk about that might go well under, under an RFI uh, process, which I can just summarize now and then, you know, happy to give you in more detail in, in between, you know, now and the next meeting that, sure. we, that we address this. But, it, but in general, I'd like to... Um, just recognize some of what we have done in the past relative to this um, these region. Um, and that is, or especially the market study, um, and that is there has been varying degrees, to some degree, of a number of market studies done um, around us for applicants that we have seen in Connecticut and Rhode Island, for example, um, that I think we should acknowledge. There's studies, uh, there's two studies, one recently updated for Rhode Island. Rhode Island did initially a study after the Gaming Act uh, trying to predict the impact of the, cas the Massachusetts casinos. Those, that study uh, was later updated uh, as, as recently as last year, I believe. And one of the things that's, that's in my mind a, a question for us again, to ask, is first the size and scope of the, of the market that we're dealing with. Um, there's some mention, there's, a, there's initial uh, recognition that it's the New England market with some um, outside, uh, you know, travelers, um, you know, a percentage of that. Uh, there's other studies that begin to um, incorporate um, uh, upstate New York to some degree. But there's, again, varying degrees of, of how the different people that analyze this uh, take that into account. 
there's uh, something that's alluded to here and in the past, uh, in my mind, changing preferences, uh, what may have been as uh, um, um, a suite of products in 2012, when we first looked at these, may be different. And now, if we were making uh, projections for the future, and that includes sports betting and how millennials are behaving and how uh, slots are uh, forming uh, a part of the, of the casino market or not, um, I think it's important to kind of think about that suite of gaming products Again, I can give you details on, on, on these pieces, but um, the response, the, the, the size and scope, the response that has happened since the projections were first made for Massachusetts, I think <coughs> is also a very important piece. Um, Rhode Island um, responded uh, by the, to the Gaming Act by expanding tables um, in one of the two licenses uh, and moving a license from uh, Newport Grant to Tiverton. Um, I think that has that said something that um, uh, not all market studies have uh, necessarily considered. Um, and then there's a very um, uncertain uh, moving pieces uh, uh, around us as well, not just in the in the sports betting arena, but uh, Connecticut with a third or potentially a fourth casino, uh, the specter of the Mashpee, as you clearly allude here, must add some some level of uncertainty to the to the whole gaming market uh, as well. Um, I, I also wanted to um, to, to point out uh, uh, something for the benefit of the discussion here, the public and, and our uh, newer uh, uh, commissioners, and that is th this is a um, a region that we have uh, s spoken a lot about um, from the beginning because of the MASHP. Um, and the threat of that uh, uh, imbalance between uh, the tax rate and the compact and, and a second casino in that region. And um, I, again, I should remind us for the record that um, we had the initial discretion of setting the minimum investment, the minimum capital investment of including certain costs or, or, or not in that 500 million minimum uh, capital investment. We excluded, like the statute allowed us, the, la the land, the cost of land, um, but he, uh, excluded a number of other costs as well from, uh, from the regions A and B, notably carried interest, uh, which can be a significant cost if there's a long development uh, uh, project. And um, when it came to the third region, region C, because there was not a lot of interest, seemingly, we came back and, and excluded, rather included back some of those costs to the minimum capital investment, effectively lowering the minimum capital investment that we had already written, by the way, um, for this region only. And so um, that was all done in, in the spirit of trying to elicit more uh, competition. Uh, there was at the time another developer uh, trying to put a deal together uh, and, and could not. Um, and, um, and I think, again, just uh, um, so that we have a, a recollection of all the factors that have factored in here, um, I also want to just state for the record that we should not be, or the public should not be under the impression that any one of these responses, individually or collectively, to these, to these questions are going to point conclusively in any one direction. Uh, I, I may be stating the obvious here, but um, I think ultimately, opening or not, this, uh, this region is going to be a judgment call. We, we might get a new study or a new series of studies, or a reconciliation of a study, or really good, insightful questions, like we have answers, but rather, to some of the questions that we are posing here. And it's ultimately going to be very much uh, a judgment call for uh, uh, the reasons that I already alluded to. Um, one is uh, uh, it's, it's much easier to make the first decision, licensing decision, than it is to make the fourth one. Uh, of course, now we should be very um, aware of the performance, like, like one of the questions here says, 
of the performance of the current existing licensees, of the responses of the states around us. It is, it is obviously a lot more relevant than when we first made the first decision. Um, and so I, um, I think it's, 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 um, it's again a region that we have struggled with uh, uh, to elicit a lot of competition. Uh, by the way, um, I think the clearest sign that, uh, that there might be a market here uh, is a developer willing to put up money to do it. There's no amount of studies that will, uh, that will uh, up, you know, conclude uh, in any way um, whether there's, there's, there's a market uh, or not. If there's somebody with the expertise of operating in other competitive areas <coughs> that thinks they can make money here, um, that's about as good indication as we're going to have. Um, again, we need to think about a number of other things. What it does to the rest of the licensees, in what context they're beginning to come in and operate. Uh, but I just wanted to mention uh, for the record that ultimately it will be a, a perhaps quite difficult judgment call, not, not anything that's going to be answered through to some of the questions that we're posing. Although I do think more information is a good thing. Absolutely. It helps us tremendously and in independent studies as opposed to one, um, as we've seen in the past, as, as to one produced for a particular applicant, um, they can differ. And we've seen that in the past. Um, I think that's what you were trying to put, point out, correct? Yep. And the only, and I think you alluded to this as well, which is because there's one developed that, that, that is interested in building, I, I do think we have an obligation to the region. I think Commissioner O'Brien has po pointed this out in the past, but we do to the Commonwealth as well. And if a, uh, a potential applicant is going to cannibalize from our own in-state casinos, that is uh, 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 something to consider. I think you were yeah. pointing that out. With yeah. It's nice that the developer says, yes, uh, I'd like to build, but it, it's, it's incumbent upon us to look at every factor um, before making a decision here. Actually, you reminded me of something that is, that is critical uh, as well in, in these uh, different studies that have been made. Uh, because we have uh, a different tax rate on between category ones and category twos, um, depending on how some of these studies assume, there will be an effect, an additional category one casino have an effect of Plain Ridge. Um, you have to assume that Plain Ridge with a third casino, Plain Ridge is going to lose some a play and retain some play. But every new dollar that we gain, and this is, I'm only talking about revenues, any new dollar that we gain on an additional category one comes at 25% versus 49% that we lose. So mm, just on that differential, uh, there are uh, different outcomes um, in terms of revenues to the common. Now, uh, I also should point out that that's only one measure, uh, the revenues. There's many others that, that uh, Mr. Bloom has pointed out before um, that are critical in making our decisions, some of them uh, directly related to the municipality. You know, if we, if we have the context of jobs, a region, uh, uh, a city or town, that's a very different calculation uh, to the overall Commonwealth view that, as you point out, Commissioner, we also have to take into consideration. Uh, but revenues is only one measure. Um, I think it's, it's very important for us to now really consider, and that question is really here, the profitability of the current uh, licensees, uh, because that has some stability uh, uh, to the future um, of those uh, licenses. Um, it's it's going to be, uh, 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 it all goes back to, a, as well, uh, ultimately a judgment call. How much do we think the gaming market might change um, because of consumer preferences, because of other products that are later approved or not um, are within Massachusetts or around us? Um,
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I certainly uh, think, a, uh, first of all, with respect to the letter, <coughs> excuse me, with respect to the letter from the mayor, um, we should be thinking about formulating an appropriate response. He took the time to, to write us and raise several points and to the degree uh, we can respond to some of those in a response I think is, uh, is appropriate. I probably respectfully uh, disagree with some of the comments that are included in the letter, but that's the, uh, um, the benefit of having uh, some appropriate give and take. Um, just to echo Commissioner Zuniga, I agree with them on one of the questions uh, that was down for public comment. Uh, could be moved or considered in issuing an RFI. Uh, I would like to see us proceed with an RFI. I don't think it is a very long process. Again, we're just, we're not asking people to uh, supply a certain proposal, but to answer some some basic questions that we have. I think Commissioner Zuniga's comments about um, about the market, some of the market changes that we've seen just since we opened our first licensee, uh, the need for us, uh, and I think we're all aware of this, to consider the uh, impacts on the overall Massachusetts market and the current revenue and employment um, that is created by our, our three licensee is important to consider. Um, in one of my colleagues might correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do remember some of the early market studies we did or that were presented to us talked a lot about, a lot about obviously recapturing revenue that was going out. But it also highlighted the potential to create new players. And I think, again, I'm, I'm kind of just uh, throwing this suggestion out that maybe we haven't seen that develop as much as might have been anticipated in some of the early marketing studies, that the presence of a casino was going to generate new players. And I don't think some of those goals or projections have, uh, have necessarily met the mark. So um, I, I think for right now, the immediate step we can take, we always put, it's great to put public comment out there. People can even comment to us on things or topics that aren't necessarily included in the questions. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, most of the time in our recent history that we have put some comments out for public or questions out for public comment. Uh, the bulk of the response has come from folks who are living in Brockton and uh, for the most part many of those have not been in favor of of opening Region C, um, but I would like to encourage staff to move ahead and kind of refine some of these questions and move ahead with an RFI process. Again, I don't think it will take that long to get some um, qualified answers back. We're not asking them to respond to a full-blown proposal. Um, I think we can do this in a pretty timely manner if that's the direction we choose to take. Um. Uh, you bring up a good point, uh, um, among others, um, uh, uh, Commissioner, and, and that about um, you know, new players. And I think um, one of the things that I was trying to articulate is relative to um, uh, consumer preferences uh, or some um, uh, the suite of products that people engage with. Um, I've looked at uh, uh, some of the trends around us on purely slots. Uh, play because that is, um, that is actually um, information that's readily available for anybody around us. Um, and um, the, the, the slot play level um, of uh, 2007, 2008, just, just in New England, um, is not, has, you know, that, that was prior to the uh, financial um, recession, um, has not come back. Uh, yet, uh, even you know, in in recent years, with now you know two two more casinos, um, and I'm talking MGM and um, and Plainridge. There's not enough information yet on Anchor that that can now be uh, ascertained on a yearly basis. Uh, although it, it'll soon will. So um, th that to me begins to speak about uh, uh, you know we, we have had a very long financial. Um, um, 
business cycle in the in the upswing um, that I think has re recovered a lot of the um, the downturn of the uh, prior to the financial or right after the financial uh, crisis. Um, but I I believe uh, there may be something going on with purely slot play. Um, there may be um, you know people younger players uh, maybe engaging in a, in a different way, um, and that that. That is the point about you know how much more uh, revenue, aggregate revenue, uh, is 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 coming in. It may I suspect it may be around some of the different uh, products. Um, I don't know to what degree any one of these um, people that now engage online a lot more, um, whether they are they will continue to engage in in, in slot play for example. Um, I don't know if there's a gener generational thing operating here, um, but those are some of the questions that I think we should at least attempt to uh, articulate on a um, broad level. Um, if we get too granular, then it might start to resemble an RFP or an RFR, um, but those are things that I think are operating in, in, in our, what I think will be ultimately, again, a judgment and probably difficult uh, decision. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say it sounds like, um, Commissioner Stebbins anyway, you're talking about both, uh, an RFI and public comment, right? Yes. And I, I would agree with that. All the information we can gather is important, hearing from the public as well as um, a little more formal process with an RFI is really important to help us decide a direction to move or not. And I think uh, information is critical to help us with, with that decision. Um, I do, I would echo the comments that have already been made. I do think these would be helpful, particularly um, the RFI in terms of the market study, I think would be helpful. Another question that I think is more an internal question than an RFI or a public comment, however, is we do have a potential applicant who has had a host community vote. The motion to reconsider that application we did not entertain that. So if and when C is open and this applicant comes forward again, I think there's still an open question of law whether another host community vote is needed or not. That's not relevant to the public comment in the RFI. But I just throw that out as something internally that maybe the GC group um, can be thinking about to the extent that, that we are in a posture where that same applicant comes back before us. Uh, I think it's a very valid question. I mean, you know. You could, we got, could do a superficial analysis and say the process is all is all new again. You know, next process would be all new, so it starts from from ground zero. And one of the tenets of the Expanded Gaming Act appears to be that no community will get a casino unless it wants one. Um, and I I don't think the law says currently, um, but I think that's a fair uh, a fair issue we can start to look at in the background. I understand we're not there yet. Um, but it's fair, I think, to uh, consider that. And, and if we are speaking about the one that we did look at, there was actually a different proposal. Right. So one would think yeah, that the right. host community might, um, the vote that was taken before would be stale because they were voting on something very different. Sure. So that's just something to consider. What I'm hearing Commissioner O'Brien is saying is that perhaps um, for legal to, to address that at least at some level right now would be probably helpful because we would want um, all folks to understand that would be an expectation if if that's um, you know if that's where we come out uh, I, I don't think that any of our comments today s suggest that we actually know the answer to that question so thank you um, on my thoughts um, <clears throat> I agree uh, again with many of the the um, points made I think that the efforts that we are trying to achieve here is to do some good good due diligence it is a, a big issue our law gives us direction but it does require judgment so I think uh, Commissioner Zuniga is, is spot on and I think that the RFI will be an excellent tool to get exactly what the concept is, to get information that will allow us 
if we decide to go forward with a, a request for um, proposals on a market study, because I think we all agree an independent market study would be reflective of past practice that served its purpose then and, and would serve our purpose now. Um, if we are going to issue one, we would want it to be as efficient um, and as um, precise as we could possibly make it. RF, RFQ, RFQs are, um, I'm sorry, RFPs are, are not easy to get right. And we've seen in other jurisdictions where they have to do a reissuance. And so the RFI is a tool to sort of help us really understand what the issues are, how we would craft a, a, a precise and helpful request for a market study. With that said, I think we learned from uh, Derek last at our last meeting, it could be a few months to issue an RFI. I would echo, I think, Commissioner Stebbins that it, it doesn't have to be a long process. So I would, um, I would today, I'm not sure if we need a vote, and, 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 and I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but we have a memo that outlines a, a, uh, very good questions for an RFI and some very good uh, points for public comment. We could always extend that as we see maybe public comments coming in. We could um, decide whether there should be additional requests for public comment. But it seems to me it would be too bad to, to go another round without maybe getting the RFI process going unless there's an objection. No, I think that's fair. Perhaps uh, after this discussion, we can we can come back with, you know, the what, what would hopefully be a, a draft, sure. uh, but close to final uh, language around an RFI. Um, I and and you know and, and get it going. Edit, yeah. You know, yeah. and, get, and get going. I think oh, here's Mr. Lynn now. I did. <laughs> did you hear me talking about you, Derek? Um, I'm I. I agree with that, um, and this is Derek who can actually maybe go over some of the steps. Does, we have to post a notice of intent first, and could we take that initial th that initial step without a draft, or how does it work? So we don't actually have to post a notice of intent because okay. I have it on. We don't actually have to post a notice of intent because we don't have a dollar value for the procurement. Oh, good. So you'd only have to do the notice of intent if it's going to be 40 days and your procurement won't be up for 40 days and it's going to exceed the 540,000 required by the World Trade Organization. I see. Um, so we could, last time when I went over the timeline, I said a couple weeks to develop the questions, which I think we've kind of done now, mm -hmm. um, put it out for about a month and then some time to review it before you come back here. That's where the two month time period came in. And, I and know you we generously did say you would be yeah. willing to uh, I'm expedite. always willing to cut back yeah. and streamline. Um, but, um, you know, that's where the two month timeline came in, just to be safe. Mm -hmm. But we could get the uh, a draft underway. Yeah. Uh, and I guess our next meeting is um, Mary Ann, January 9th. 9th. So I am so suggest the one thing I'm going to just want some clarity on. It sounds like um, the third bullet under public comment questions about should the commission engage in a new market study, you might want to shift over, mm -hmm. maybe be the first broad question for the RFI. That's my that's my suggestion. I think um, it, you know, although there's many members of the public that are usually very informed, I think this 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 is really. And, uh, and Quite uh, frankly, you know, I think RFI that sort of introductory question from public comment will capture everything. Yes. So it's, it's, I think you're totally fine doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of posting the, the um, public comments, we could get that underway. And we would be working with uh, Communications Director Tristel. Sure. We could and get that. <clears throat> the process typically is that we uh, actually get those comments along the way or I'd suggest that because if we get extensive comments, it will be hard for us to get up to speed for the, for the meeting and that might actually help inform our review of the draft RFI. So if we get anything in between, between now and then. I would suggest initially probably putting them out for 30 
days from oh, the day I see. we we do have to have a yeah some type of a deadline line. as opposed to rolling in. Um, it's up to you. I mean, there are, I've seen where we get a bulk up front, or we get some people who wait to a deadline to spur action. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do something in between, uh, uh, it is the holidays. Yes, so it is. I, I think it's fair to launch it when we issue the RFI and try to keep the time frames consistent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not and and not okay. have them at all to inform. That's fine. Okay. Are you okay with that, Commissioner? Yes. Okay. So on the 9th, we would come back with a draft RFI with the questions as obviously, hopefully correct, but as close as possible, and then a draft request for public comment with the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much. Any Thank further you. questions? Thank you. And, and Thanks, Derek, for Derek, sprinting over. Amazing, uh, amazing timing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and. We're all set? Yes. Thank you, uh, Executive Director Petrosian. Welcome. We're moving on now to item number five. I'm, I'm sorry, item number six uh, on our research for responsible gaming, uh, RF, RFP, and Director Vander Linden. And I do know that we have um, a team coming forward in uh, Dr. Volberg has a flight to catch, and we also know that she made some arrangements rescheduling her travel plans to be here, so thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Um, it's been a long uh, journey over the past several months to get to a point um, where we're making this recommendation today. Um, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Rachel Volberg, who is the principal investigator of the Sigma study, um, as well as professor at uh, the UMass Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences. Um, I also have uh, Mark Melnick, who is the director of Sorry, Dr. Mark Melnick is the director of. Um, I wasn't going to correct you. Uh, I'll correct myself. Uh, director of um, Economic and Policy Research at the UMass Donahue Institute, and finally, uh, Martha, Zorn. Uh, Martha Zorn, <laughs> who is a data manager um, extraordinaire with the um, Sigma team, um, and out of the School of Public Health and Health Sciences. So thank you for for coming today. Um, chapter 23K, Section 71, um, we all know very well. It directs the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to develop an annual research agenda in order to understand the social and economic um, effects of expanded gaming in the Commonwealth, as well as to obtain scientific information relative to the neuroscience, psychology, epidemiology, and etiology of gambling. Since 2014, efforts to fulfill this mandate have resulted in a comprehensive baseline understanding of conditions prior to uh, casino introduction, as well as numerous follow-up studies uh, that give stakeholders a greater understanding of the true effects of casino gambling in Massachusetts on residents, towns, and communities. The original procurement for this study was drafted in 2013, um, executed in 2014, um, and uh, expired at the end of fiscal year 2019. The MGC released an RFR to solicit bids for a multi-year, multi-method, multidisciplinary, multi-phase, comprehensive research project on the economic and social impacts of the introduction of casino gambling in Massachusetts. The RFR presented the MGC an opportunity to build upon the existing research conditions, but it also allowed us an opportunity to turn to a new chapter of our research agenda, which was, is largely guided by a research strategic plan that the Commission adopted um, in 2018. There was a wide release of the R RFR um, to a number of different stakeholders. Um, however, we had only one respondent to that, which is our current contractor, UMass Amherst. 
Um, that did not stop our review team from thoroughly uh, reviewing and, um, and diving deep in, into that proposal and providing, um, providing comments and feedback. Um, our procurement team included um, several from the MGC, our legal, our financial division, myself. Um, it also included four of our research review committee, um, Drs. Tom Land, um, Tony Roman, Bruce Cohen, and David Auerbach. Um, they represented a, a wealth of um, information and diverse background in both the areas of uh, social and economic um, research. Um, since the Sigma team um, delivered their initial proposal in August, we went through four rounds of comments and feedback. The Sigma team um, patiently, diligently um, responded to each round of feedback and revised their, their proposal. Um, or responded to questions that the that the team had. Um, at the end of it, though, the the procurement team unanimously endorsed the proposed scope and budget that was presented by the Sigma team, which is which is was represented here today. The thoughtful proposal produced by Sigma team strives to provide a comprehensive understanding of key measure, measures of interest to the MGC as well as our stakeholders. Um, it incorporates priorities of the Gaming Commission, such as community engagement, knowledge translation, as well as the flexibility to respond to new and emerging issues um, that are, are identified by the Commission and our stakeholders. In fact, there is um, the plan for two to four of those, those studies each year. The average annual budget spanning five and a half years is, is $1 million per year with the exception of next year when it's uh, necessary that the team do a follow-up general population survey that builds upon the baseline general population survey that was fielded in 2014 prior to the introduction of, of Plain Ridge, opening of Plain Ridge Park Casino. The strength of their proposal rests on a number of overarching features. Um, it includes, as represented by the three individuals here today, a highly skilled and experienced team um, who over the past six years have produced 29 reports and academic publications. Continuity with the existing research, which would build on a multifaceted, multi-year economic impact of the studies uh, conducted to date. <coughs> um, comprehensive or collaborative orientation, whereby major stakeholders, including you as, as the Gaming Commission, um, the Department of Public Health, um, other, other stakeholders around the state um, are able to provide comment and help guide the research. Um, we talked early on about a state-of-the-art um, analytical framework which um, was developed by Dr. Volberg and her co-PI, Dr. Rob Williams, even prior to um, prior to the first RFP being released, I think it was uh, in 2012, 2012, okay, 2011. Um, it focuses on a comprehensive analysis establishing the impacts of casino gambling over both time and at the state and regional level. Um, it focuses on policy relevant findings so that it can inform practice, it can inform regulation, it can inform policy. Um, and an ongoing evaluation, which produces a comprehensive report every two to three years, as opposed to a simple pre versus post um, study, which was described in the original scope. Um, over the next 18 months, I provided for you in your memo a list of the, uh, the reports that are planned. Um, this does not include the ad hoc reports, which um, we can help design and, and drive the focus of those, those reports um, in the near future. Um, that's the proposal in a nutshell. Um, I think um, before I, I uh, move to um, make a recommendation that the commission um, initiate a contract with, with the team, um, I wanted to provide an opportunity for uh, Dr. Volberg to provide some statements, but obviously also comments from the Commission. Questions, Commissioner O'Brien? 
Do you have any questions at this point? Commissioner Cameron. I do not. Commissioner Stebbins? Nope. Commissioners? Um, you know, I, I will, um, you know, perhaps we should hear from, um, from Dr. Volver. I, I, I would like to make a couple of points uh, uh, later relative to the context uh, for funding, but this is more directed to our, to ourselves. Can, can I ask uh, just a, I may have not heard correctly. The document says that the average annual budget spanning five and a half years. So this is, the contract is for, would be for how many years? So there was a six-month extension on the original procurement that expires on December 31st, and then there are five additional um, contract years planned after, after that. There's, yes. As opposed to three plus two options, it's five years. It, it would be three plus, three three plus, plus one plus options, but the budget that was presented that we reviewed um, spanned five years. But the contract is three with a, you'd have to come back to the commission Correct. for the extension yeah. of each individual one year options. Right. So the initial contract that I'm proposing um, would be 18 months. So it would extend through the yeah, rest of this right. fiscal year and fiscal year 21. And, and that's reflected in the chart. Correct. Um, and, and, and it would be renewed budget with an, uh, obviously everything beyond that in terms of the, uh, the the budget and the scope of those works is reviewed on, on an annual basis, too. Okay, and in terms of your enumerated list, one through eight of the proposal on your overarching features, I think you suggested there was some differences from what has been done in the past. Can, can you point out what are new? And that will just help frame our discussion. Sure, today. sure, um, and I'll invite um, Rachel to join in, but um, there's a there's a much greater attention to um, the measures that that matter. So at this point, how many how many years we're into this, we begin to understand what are what are the measures that are likely to change, and we will have a greater focus on on those measures. But we can still stay attuned to other measures that that perhaps kind of sit in the background. Um, there's a greater attention to um, engaging the community, recognizing that the translation of this research is as important as the is, is as important as the research itself, um, and, and making sure. Can you sure just explain that so that everybody hears that what you mean by translation of the sure, research? Sure. Yeah. Um, um, we want to make sure that that the research means something that it really does do what we, what we say we want it to do. We want it to inform um, practice. We want it to inform policy and regulation. But a lot of times research doesn't, doesn't make bridge that, that gap between the research being done and the regulation that's being promulgated, or the policy that's being, being done. So we want to, to focus on that, that space between so that that translation can, can happen um, to truly um, impact uh, policy regulation and practice as we as we intended to do we have a great obligation to do that and I think that the longer this this research program or agenda continues the more data that we have um, it can go in two different directions uh, it can be so much research that that we kind of lose focus and um, or it can be um, and not be relevant or it can be so much research that ends up being um, a gold mine of information that really does have this this um, um, uh, impact on on our decision making, on key stakeholders' decision making, and that's where we need to go. I believe in the in the next um, in the next iteration of this contract. That's where we need to go as a commission with the research program in general, not just with with the Sigma team, but whether it's that or public safety mm -hmm. or um, the individual studies that we have with communities around the state that are just going to continue to grow. Um, what else, uh, did you want to add the, to that? The free post versus the sure. Do you want to talk about? It? Um, sure. Uh, so the original proposal that we submitted back in uh, 2012, actually, um, was for a pre post design. So essentially what that meant in terms of assessing uh, social impacts was 
uh, doing a very large population survey before any of the licenses had been announced and then waiting until everything had become operational and then doing a second very large um, replication of the first uh, survey um, to identify changes that might have occurred uh, in gambling attitudes, uh, gambling behavior, problem gambling prevalence, and a host of other uh, related measures. What I think um, no one anticipated, least of all uh, the research team, was uh, the amount of time that it was going to take for the licensing process to happen, and in particular for the two very large resort-style casinos to be built. So we anticipated over a six-year period that we would field the baseline survey very early on, which we did in 2013, and that then we anticipated that by now we would actually be um, done with the study, and or at least with that proposed study, um, which would have measured um, gambling behavior after all of the casinos had opened. Um, that's not going to uh, obviously happen in the life of uh, the existing study since, um, you know, we, we had to wait a year after all of the casinos had opened in order to um, be able to capture changes in behavior that reflected the operations of all of the casinos in Massachusetts. So while we waited to um, figure out the right timing for that survey, um, we've actually uh, done a lot of work to uh, build uh, systems and data collection mechanisms and data analysis mechanisms such that um, we've been monitoring baseline conditions and then uh, conditions in the wake of the construction of the casinos, but we're still sort of just about to begin the operational phase of the study, which would include um, that very large population survey to look at um, what the changes have been in behavior. So it's the, because of the extent of time that it took to roll out the casinos, I think, um, we've been talking certainly internally in the team for quite a long time about um, this really isn't going to be a pre-post study anymore. It's going to be more of a rolling evaluation of looking at, you know, every few years what's going on with the social and economic impacts that we're looking at. And, and if I may, I think that's actually a, a more accurate and appropriate way to assess impacts anyway, um, as we're looking at the kinds of things that influence industry impacts. There's all these external mitigating circumstances that are separate and above from just a, a, a a linear way of thinking about pre and post, right? There's going to be new marketplaces that emerge. Uh, you know, when when this whole thing started, legalized sports gambling wasn't on anybody's radar. Now it is, and the, these kinds of things will uh, obviously introduce themselves over time. So I think this periodic um, uh, assessment is much more appropriate uh, anyway. I just had a question to follow up. You said that you had to wait a year after the casinos were open to then go do the survey to gather the impact study. Is there a research paradigm that drives that yes, one year there or is. there yeah. is? Yeah, typically, um, and just to preface this by um, <laughs> seizing from my prepared remarks, um, I've been a full-time gambling researcher since 1985. So this is like all I've done for my entire professional career. Um, and there is very good, very solid evidence from multiple jurisdictions that typically um, what happens with the introduction of a new form of gambling is about between, a, within about a year to two years of that introduction, you see a bump in the prevalence of problem gambling. So an increase in the number of people who would be classified as having a gambling problem. And then over time, so you know, four years, six years later, um, that bump disappears, but it does, not, um, it does not eliminate the fact that that increase in prevalence following uh, the major introduction um, increases the proportion of the population that is vulnerable to developing a gambling problem in the future. So it's a, it's a very important um, sort of window of measurement, if you will, to be able to see what the effect is because it disappears after a while 
And if you don't take that measure in a timely way, if you don't put that survey in the field in a timely way, you'll miss it and you won't know what the actual impacts were further out. Does that extend to other impacts or are we focusing that one year exclusively on problem gambling? The research evidence is, is specific to problem, problem gambling. gambling. We, okay. don't, we don't know about the other impacts. Okay. Did you have a, a more formal remarks? I did. I prepared five minutes and I timed myself several times. Um, <laughs> so if you will indulge me. Happy um, holidays, Dr. Fulberg. <laughs> thank you. My family is in New Orleans, hoping that I will be joining them soon. Great. Um, my first appearance at an open meeting of this commission was on March 28, 2013, when I was invited to discuss the launch of a unique, first of its kind, research project to study the social and economic impacts of casinos in Massachusetts. Before beginning my prepared remarks that day, I somewhat breathlessly mentioned that I had been working towards a project like this for many years, and to be kicking it off in my home state of Massachusetts made this the most exciting day of my professional career. When Commissioner McHugh understandably stopped me and asked me to elaborate, I explained that I had been involved full time in gambling research since 1985, so at this point that's over 30 years. And in all of that time, only one jurisdiction anywhere in the world had established an ongoing research program to examine the impacts of new forms of gambling as these evolve over time. That jurisdiction is New Zealand. I'm proud of the fact that very early on, I played a role in ensuring that our state legislature was aware of the very best research on gambling being done internationally. I was happily surprised when I saw that the Expanded Gaming Act included not only a specific research component, but also a mechanism for ensuring that the research was funded. And today, I'm pleased to be able to once again say that this is a most exciting day in my professional career. Researchers have speculated that there would be a very significant positive impacts early in the introduction of a new form of gambling related to tax revenues, economic development, and employment. But over time, these positive impacts might be balanced out and perhaps eventually outweighed by some of the negative social impacts, most specifically problem gambling, but also crime, population health, and environmental impacts. Before I go any further on that, I want to um, just say a heartfelt thank you to all of the members of the Sigma team. Almost all of them have been with the project since its inception, and it has been a true privilege to learn from them how to be an effective leader. Every member of the Sigma team has a distinct area of expertise, but over the years, we have evolved into a cohesive and cooperative group that, in my humble opinion, offers the Gaming Commission and the Commonwealth an unparalleled depth of experience and expertise as you seek to understand and address the impacts of gambling in Massachusetts. Since uh, the study that uh, we discussed uh, that very first day in front of Commissioner McHugh has launched, we have comprehensively documented baseline social and economic conditions and analyzed the economic impacts of the construction of two of the three casinos in Massachusetts. We are delighted now to be gearing up for a new and exciting phase of the project, namely an evaluation of the social and economic impacts of the operations of Massachusetts casinos as these roll out over the next several years. It has taken longer than I think anyone anticipated, but we are very much looking forward to being able to deliver on the, on the major goals of the study that we originally proposed. Some of you will recall our surprise a year ago at the lack of social impacts identified in Plainville after the opening of Plain Ridge Park Casino. While there were clearly positive economic impacts, we did not find any increase in the rate of problem gambling or in any of the disorders related indices. We cautioned at the time that the impacts associated with MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor were likely to be quite different than the impacts of Plain Ridge Park. 
Most importantly, the two resort-style casinos are much larger than Plain Ridge Park and have more diverse amenities, but also are located in more diverse and economically challenged communities. Looking ahead, we are particularly interested to see if there are differences in the impacts specific to the type of casino and or to the communities where they are located. Understanding such differences will be important in crafting effective and efficient responses to minimize and mitigate any negative impacts and ensure that the introduction of casino gambling provides the greatest possible benefits to the citizens of the Commonwealth. I look forward to answering your questions. Commissioner Cameron? Well, I don't know that I have questions, uh, just comment. Um, first of all, I think, uh, and I've said this before, traveling uh, to conferences throughout the world, people are very, very impressed with our research. And um, I would say envious, frankly, um, because I think funding is an issue when it comes to this. So um, I just want to commend the team for, for really um, uh, putting forth a product that is um, uh, that is top-notch um, and I love uh, the piece what Mark talked about which was um, using it effectively you know not just having the research stand alone out here but actually making decisions based on um, the information that's that, that comes to us from from the research so I just wanted to thank you all for that um, it you know, makes me proud to travel and, and listen around the world uh, uh, to people uh, comment about the research and really find it useful to them. Um, and I know how hard the team worked to come up with uh, a plan for the next five years that makes sense. Um, so uh, you know, I'm certainly supportive of, uh, of uh, this proposal. Um. You know, I, I did want to make a couple of uh, comments, uh, one of which uh, was already um, mentioned by uh, Dr. Wahlberg, but um, I think um, I would like to clarify, um, to, to expound a little bit on, um, and that is the initial, uh, the initial timeline. Um, the reason, a, a big reason for um, what effectively, now looking back at six years ago, what effectively caused us to um, um, to shift uh, in, in terms of time um, some of these um, analyses uh, and, and, and move into other areas um, was a referendum. Um, we, there was, uh, you know, we started, this was prior to a, a referendum that would have effectively, could have effectively eliminated the Gaming Act altogether. Um, and we, uh, at the time, could not make a commitment uh, like we had initially planned on when it came to this particular contract, uh, if we were all going to go home potentially, um, <laughs> that was the reality. Um, so, you know, when it's when when, when we talk back uh, about how long it took, uh, that was factor number one. Um, later, um, I'm just going to try to summarize uh, both um, very difficult development um, projects and um, a number of lawsuits uh, added into, into, into that timeline. So we find uh, ourselves where, where we did. We reacted very um, uh, swiftly, I think, uh, very uh, in, in nimble ways. And, and Dr. Uh, Melnick and, and Volberg uh, uh, were, were instrumental in helping us, helping us do that. Um, which, lead, which leads me to my, my second uh, point that I did want to make as well here. Uh, it was alluded to, but let me just also mention. The initial response from the Sigma team um, was richer in what they were proposing than what we thought was um, what we wanted to do here going, going forward. And, um, and, and that was what really originated the four rounds of questions and, and responses. Um, and that is in the context of the funding uh, that I, again, wanted to, to mention here. We initially had um, all the discretion for funding just reside with the Gaming Commission for this, what was a very significant uh, commitment. There was a question always uh, 
as to how we could assess uh, and fund this these, these, uh, research. There's a public health trust fund that um, uh, it wasn't clear that it was going to be operational until after the licenses were operational. Um, but there was a clear mandate for a, and a need for a baseline study. So we, we, we used our ability, our, our ability to assess licensees to fund all of that initial uh, research. And, uh, and again, I think we, we struck the balance that, that, needed, that needed to happen. The funding going forward now is really intended to come from the Public Health Trust Fund, which is now operational. It's mostly funded by the activities of um, the licensees, the taxes. There's a 5% um, on, on gross gaming revenue that, that funds the trust fund, and a $5 million assessment that we, that we make. We have uh, been working with uh, the DPH, who are the other members of the Public Health Trust Fund, under an MOU that does dictate uh, that uh, a minimum of 75% of those funds will be for activities that DPH has, unless it's otherwise agreed by the co-chairs of the Public Health Trust Fund. And it is in that context that we have now really had the need to, um, to really look at what is most likely to be changing and measure accordingly. Um, they have their own priorities to now try to build capacity for uh, treatment of uh, problem gambling and at-risk gambling. Uh, we have our own directive uh, as well and priorities, in this case research, but also some of the other responsible gaming um, measures, uh, as rather initiatives. And that has been a, a very important context into those discussions that I think ultimately strike uh, an important balance. It's still a significant uh, commitment uh, for us, uh, but it comes with a re evaluation by the Sigma team in what it means to have the resources that they've had towards analyzing uh, those impacts. Um, I will also say that there is a, uh, Mark only spoke to this generally, but there is uh, a carve out, if you will, uh, that is not part of the $1 million a year commitment for the follow-up general population survey that I, um, that, that the, the the research team has been very careful in making sure that any planning uh, that's needed for that follow-up um, is at least accounted currently in the current contract, but that we would come back, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, uh, for, to seek uh, approval to the commission for when we get that, whenever we get that. Um, the follow-up general population um, uh, study is planned for fiscal year uh, 22. And so this initial contract period takes us through fiscal year 21. When we get to fiscal year 22, um, this gives us uh, kind of a foundation that we're working from and, a, and some assumptions of, of what to expect. Um, the follow-up general population survey is it's, it's a significant investment, but the, um, it provides um, uh, incredibly valuable information. So is the request today for the 4.4 for the three-year and the 1.4 for that, or? Not the 1.4. Not the yeah, 1.4. The, the so the reference today to the memo really was just a, a heads up. Yeah, the, okay. the request today really is to initiate a contract for this initial 18-month period. Okay. I'd like to add that the, having just joined the commission earlier this year, uh, I was aware of the work that you have been doing over the course of, of time um, after the, the Expanded Gaming Act was enacted because I was lucky enough to be part of early meetings involving research. Uh, <clears throat> we are very fortunate that the legislature envisioned how important this research would be given that we were a blank slate and how it could inform not only Massachusetts policy, but policy really around the world. So uh, you, you are on the forefront of important uh, policy making. I would <clears throat> add that I think a challenge 
um, for the team is that there is a lot to do. And as Mark has pointed out, it's so important to make this research relevant through the translation of knowledge. I'm trying to adopt the correct language. Um, and so that also requires uh, important time frames and, and meeting certain time expectations, which um, <clears throat> is a challenge for all of us, as I think about how late I was up last night, um, completing my work. So that will be uh, something that I'll be looking for mainly because we will be wanting to keep your research as relevant as possible to the policy making that will be going forward. And again, as Cam Commissioner Cameron said, it is, it is the envy of the world. So we're very fortunate to have your expertise long-standing expertise, and we are very fortunate to know that um, assuming the contract is all, um, res uh, con contractual issues are all resolved, that you uh, understand, you're coming from a place of understanding, having this long history with this commission, never mind your overall experience. So um, I think that I love the fact that you are prioritizing that, that practical connection. And I also know that the time frame will be a challenge, but it'll just be an expectation and one that we can work in partnership with um, this incredible team because it will just make our work and your work easier. So uh, that's without presuming we do have to have some kind of a vote today, I think or at least a consensus. Could, if I can comment just on the timing element too, I think what's important to underscore here with the commission is uh, your potential partnership for us and with us to, um, there, to help us procure the kind of data that we need in order to do the analysis in a timely manner. So uh, there's so many different things that go into our process, whether it's the yes. review of research, but there's also our reliance on the licensees who are great partners mm -hmm and allowing us to do our work, but they are a critical element of that. So the degree right. to which we recognize that um, while we do the research, there are many parts in that chain that are critical, whether it be the review committees or the licensees uh, that allow, that if all those pieces are working well together, uh, being able to get timely policy relevant research out quickly uh, is obviously of the utmost importance. Uh, but, but there are that's, several steps in, in that process. That's in fact why I mentioned it and mentioned it as a partnership because I think part of the, the challenge is that is actually coming up with a timetable so that all the pieces that you need are um, the, the timetable is set forth and so that licensees, for, for instance, would know your expectations and then we will know your expectations. And I know that um, Director Van Linden will be working on that piece because we don't want you to be scrambling for the data. Um, and, and if it re needs more time, then everybody's expectations should just be adjusted right. so that we understand. Um, we, that, we, that's, a, that's a critical point uh, that, um, you know, we, we, sh we could have mentioned earlier, but I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, Mark. Let me uh, also uh, just mention that one of the things that we are now uh, uh, contemplating is to have more of a standard of reports coming back from, from licensees. Um, they initially uh, were, happened the way they did, they were presented and some of them stuck around. Uh, and uh, this is one reason, there's others, that, uh, that we think a more streamlined um, template for how licensees report to us certain things that the statute and our regulations require, but also how they interact with and, 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 and um, send data that is also critical to the Sigma team um, will, be, will be part of that, that, that process. And that's we a also, great example of, a, of, of uh, that collaboration. part of a solution mm -hmm. to help you right. meet only because it will just keep everything relevant. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's a lot of moving pieces to get the data. Yes. 
Uh, there's also another, uh, one other thing that I will mention along those lines, and that is um, we have had uh, the, the great help of, these, of a research review committee that takes uh, and, and gives feedback on uh, initial drafts. Um, that has, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the past, extended the time frame for some of these reports more than we all, we all wanted. So there's a real um, effort I would, I would submit by, the, by, by, by everybody here that we are hoping to achieve, and that is to be more, um, to be quicker in, in, in the feedback and, and, and response uh, and, and streamline that process um, uh, going forward. The good news is that, you know, there's now a real um, understanding of how we all work and what, you know, what are the usual questions that sometimes we have. So there's a real hope that that, that process will be, um, will be improved. Uh, there is the strategic plan calls for uh, uh, another position uh, to help Mark uh, van der Linden um, that he's already posted for that will also hopefully help us uh, do that uh, and that that is an important part of the of what we think is the process here and, and my point was that you're in the driver's seat so uh, Dr. Volkberg you uh, are <laughs> you're in the driver's seat in terms of um, the product and all the pieces that you need and so setting up a time frame and really establishing expectations and understanding that there's going to be the component of our review process so that we can um, we can support that time frame and of course things happen but um, that is part of, of um, making sure that when the when your research comes out and not that there's been a, a big problem before, but as we're going forward, it's only going to become more important to keep it super relevant. I, I just want to I echo those comments. I just want to add, um, uh, it's kind of an interesting milestone that we're at, mm -hmm. but to, mm -hmm. to say once again that what we've done here, what the, you know, what the legislature and the governor, Governor Patrick at the time saw to have the foresight to understand that this research puts us on the map internationally, as well as Commissioner Cameron noted, you know, we're kind of the envy of some of our counterparts. Um, and I like a lot of the things that are new, you know, that are, as Mark outlines in his memo, are not only continuing the research that we've also already done, but as I look through what's planned for the next 18 months, um, new employee survey, patron and license plate survey, uh, just to reiterate the fact that we know that we have a broader group of stakeholders now that are interested in the research that we're doing and that communicating that out, sharing that with those stakeholders, whether they're tourism bureaus, whether they're workforce agencies, I think is going to really, again, just um, compel the impact or enhance the impact that the research is having. Uh, as well as for our internal team, as we now look at community mitigation, as we now look at workforce development and diversity, um, a lot of the research is going to help our internal team as well. So, uh, as, as the chair pointed out, this kind of uh, data translation, I think, is going to have a lot more avenues as this new contract moves forward. So, I thank you for kind of keeping that in mind as you put this proposal together. Uh, Madam Chair, I guess with that, I would move the Commission approve the request to execute a contract with UMass Sigma based on the procurement team's recommendation as outlined in the Commissioner's packet and as discussed here today. I second that. Any further, any further questions for uh, Dr. Volberg and her team or for uh, Director Vandelman? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, and good luck with the, uh, the next steps on the contracting. Thank you. There may be a second motion. Second motion. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the second motion. Um, do I have a second motion? Uh, yes, I will uh, further, uh, I will move that um, Director uh, Mark Vanderler, Van der Linden uh, be designated as the contract manager and be authorized to execute the contract on behalf of the Commission after consultation with the Office of the General Counsel. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
post, 5-0. Safe travels, and thank you again for making you. your, your rearranging your, your holiday, and to all of you, happy holidays. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. We look forward to your continued good work. Oh, yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. are we, we are really doing amazing. Oh, okay. Item number seven, Dr. Lightbound, we have a, a special guest today. <laughs> it's, it's too cold. Good morning, Dr. Lightbound. Good morning, Commissioners. Good, morning. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, today I have a really exciting um, thing that I get to do. Um, one of our uh, chief stewards uh, is getting a wonderful national award. Um, so I have Susan Walsh, who's the chief steward at Suffolk Downs, with me today. Um, the Pete Peterson Outstanding Steward Award is a national award given out by the Racing Officials Accreditation Program every year to an outstanding steward. It's named after Pete Peterson, who um, they want all the stewards um, around the country to aspire to be like. Um, integrity, um, outstanding um, knowledge of the rules of racing, and things like that are important. Uh, this award is usually given out at the University of Arizona Racetrack Symposium, um, their global symposium on uh, racing and uh, gaming at their awards luncheon, and Susan was unable to attend, so we're going to give it to her today. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, there's a special selection committee for this award. Um, their members are um, Rick Baedeker, who's the California Racing Board's Executive Director, uh, Hall of Fame jockey Pat Day, Wendy Davis, who is the University of Arizona Racetrack um, Industry Program Director, um, the former Jockey Club Steward and Naira Track Veterinarian, Dr. Ted Hill, Dan Metzinger, TOBA President, um, and Scott Wells, President of Remington and Lone Star Park, and then the former leader trainer and rope accredited steward, Hal Wiggins. So it's an outstanding um, group that makes the ultimate decision on who um, is awarded this uh, nice award. Um, to, there's an extensive uh, process. To, you have to be um, recommended. Uh, you have to have a recommendation from somebody from a racing commission, somebody from the track management, and um, a fellow steward. And so um, we started working on this. Uh, I want to thank John Morrissey, who has worked with Susan for years, who um, helped me uh, spread the word that we were doing this and um, get recommendations. Um, you can also uh, have other people put in letters of support, um, uh, trainers, um, people from your licensing staff. Um, we uh, had everybody that we asked was uh, or told that we were doing this was very enthusiastic. Um, they said it couldn't be for a nicer person, and they all wanted to do it. We could have gotten um, hundreds of people <laughs> to send in letters of recommendation. Uh, Susan has a very interesting a resume. She, <laughs> she got her bachelor's degree from Wellesley College. She got a master's degree from Harvard University. She taught Latin and Greek at Shady Hill School in Cambridge for years. Um, also, she started uh, her interest at the racetrack, and she began at the bottom so she could learn everything. She was a hot walker. She was a groom. Then she moved on to be an owner, a breeder, and an um, assistant to the track veterinarians and I think I'm missing something, trainer. a trainer. And she was a trainer as well. Uh, so she's done everything at the track. Uh, she was a founding member of the Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeders Association, which you all are familiar with. They come in on a regular basis. Um, she was the chair for years, and um, she had success. Uh, she, she had the three-year-old champion one year. <coughs> Sunny <laughs> stand. That's right. Uh, she's wrote, written two books um, about her farm and, and the different horses there, and she's written several articles about horse racing, and different uh, horse items. She uh, began um, with, as an association steward for the State Racing Commission in 2001, and in 2006 she um, was elevated to the level of chief steward. 
Uh, with Susan, the safety of the horses and the jockeys has always been paramount. She's worked on numerous initiatives to make sure that um, everything at the track is as safe as it can be. She doesn't miss any details um, <clears throat> from the uh, <laughs> flowers in the paddock area <laughs> to, um, you know, different uh, conditions with the jockeys, the trainers, the whole thing. Um, one of her um, also interests has been aftercare, thoroughbred aftercare, which has gotten a lot of interest in the industry um, over the last several years. She was one of the early people um, years ago when she had her own horses. When they retired, she made sure that either she kept them herself and provided for them in their retirement, or that she found a place uh, where they could be ridden or taken care of, um, always with the understanding that if um, the person needed to um, find another home for the horse, that they would return it to her. Um, her interest in it, um, aftercare, cont continued when um, she went to um, continuing ed for the um, position of steward. They held it in Kentucky near um, Old Friends Retirement Farm for Thoroughbreds, and she made sure to make a visit there. And I'm sure for Susan, that was the highlight of her uh, <laughs> trip. Um, the different things that Susan have done are almost too numerous to mention, but I'll just mention a few of them. Um, a trainer needed a replacement for his handicapped van, and so she was instrumental in um, helping raise funds for that. Um, he still calls her his angel. Um, one of the things that Susan did, other than just her uh, duties as a steward, was she taught um, English as a second language to um, backstretch people at Suffolk Downs on her own time. Um, Twenty years later, one of them came through our office in licensing and um, mentioned, um, he basically said, she saved my life. She taught me English. Um, let's see. Uh, one of her, um, oh, I've heard from several trainers that she's the only steward they've known, um, they raced all over the country, and that she's the only one they know that can give a trainer bad news um, about a fine or a suspension, and the trainer can leave the office happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's well respected by fellow <clears throat> um, stewards. As a matter of fact, one of them gave her a, the name plaque for her desk. Susan Walsh, chief steward, and it had the date when she began. And on the um, dash to when it would end, he put forever. <laughs> wow. Um, as you know from an earlier uh, <laughs> meeting, and I won't read it again because I could barely make it through then, but um, her, she understands that racing is so much more than just um, who has won a race and what the statistics are, and that it's the memories and all that you build at the racetracks. So um, it's with great pleasure <clears throat> that I present this award to Susan. The <clears throat> Pete Peterson Outstanding Award is presented to Susan K. Walsh for meritorious service to the North American horse racing industry as a racing steward since 2001. Susan K. Walsh continually demonstrates a conscientious commitment to a judicious and impartial decision-making process through common sense and a comprehensive understanding of the rules of racing treating everybody with respect and integrity. Congratulations, oh, Susan. Wow. Thank you, wow. Thank, you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Madam Chair, if I could <coughs> uh, take Executive Director's privilege. One of the um, real treats of going to Suffolk Downs and going up to the stewards box with Susan was not only did she oversee the race, but she would give you the history of everyone down on the track, the horses, the people, their family members, how she knew them, um, and you could just feel the richness of the history of Suffolk Downs if you got an opportunity to visit. Uh, and, and see all the, you know, the, the family connections. Um, and um, so it was a real treat, a real pleasure, and I can't imagine a more deserving person. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. First of all, how lucky are we to have one of the few women in the country as a chief steward? And I believe you're only the second woman ever to receive this award. So that's outstanding in itself. But I just would like to add that, you know, we took racing early on, remember, um, it was like, okay, we're disbanding the Racing Commission and Gaming Commission, it's all yours. When we would not have been successful as regulators, Susan, without you, frankly, to help us with that. Um, 
I learned so much from you, and your passion is infectious. Um, how much you care about, it's, it's been said, no, it's, it's, it's the horses, it's the people. It's every aspect of um, the wonderful sport that it is that you, your knowledge. Um, Dr. Lightbaum mentioned uh, one of the uh, criteria was, was knowledge. I would put you up against anyone in the world with your knowledge about racing and um, how it should be done the right way. Just sitting in the booth with you, listening as, as uh, our executive director just pointed out, your knowledge and your passion is amazing. The respect that you have from your male colleagues. Um, is is apparent as well, and as we just heard, you know, um, you're so well trusted and admired that even a, a penalty or a fine is is taken graciously because they know um, how much you understand the sport and that you're looking out for the best interest of the sport at all times. So I just uh, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you to understand. And, and learn from you, and I know how lucky we've been to have you here, and I'm so glad you've been recognized for your accomplishments. They are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Light Brown for generating all the background for this award, because I thought you just wrote somebody's name and put it in a hat, and it was much more complicated, and she did all <laughs> that background. However, she never told me she was going to make a speech about this. So I wasn't prepared, but um, I wish, I, I don't know where to begin. When, when I was training horses, uh, one of the horses we had at the track at the time, we retired, and we didn't have anybody coming up, so I had to stop training. And in the summer of 2000, I was working at Rockingham, as I called it, the fake vet, <laughs> anyway. And my husband, but that, was gonna, that job was gonna end in September. And I got home one day and my husband said, oh, you won't believe this. In the raising form, there's an ad they want a steward at Suffolk Downs. I, he said, you've got to apply. I said, Jim, I'm not going to apply for that. Those are just old guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just never had thought of, of that as being a career choice. And when I was a trainer, a steward was somebody you avoided at all costs. You just didn't want to know about the steward. So, just to humor my husband, I applied, and unbeknownst, and amazingly, I got the job. And I must say, every morning for the next 19 years, when I was waking up in the morning, and I thought, what day is it? Oh, I have to go to work. That was a good thing. I never, ever didn't try to get to work to start the day, because you never knew what was going to come in that door when you got to your office. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And People that I've known at the racetrack, I've been to Harvard, and I can tell you honestly that some of the smartest people I know, I know from the racetrack. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. And my only regret is, I'm gonna go down in history as the last steward. But other than that, it's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lightburn. Thank you. Most me. deserving. Thank Most deserving. Most deserving. Congra you. Congratulations, Ms. Walsh. Um, I, I did have a question. Uh, prior, you, how did you first uh, get involved in, in racing? You, you mentioned when you first <laughs> were uh, a steward. When I was uh, a little kid, um, I didn't want a pony for Christmas. I wanted a racehorse. <laughs> because <laughs> when I was a kid, we got a television, we, which I, we, our first television, and I got to watch the Kentucky Derby. 1955, and I chose to root for this one beautiful horse, and he won. And from then on, I was obsessed with horse racing. I used to grab my, my father's copy of Sports Illustrated and tear out the part about racing, and I kept him in the square. I've always loved horse racing. And my first horse, when I finally got out of my education and I had a job and I could afford a horse, it was a horse from the track. And that's been it for me. They're just, they're wonderful, wonderful animals. And everyone that works at the track is only there because of how wonderful those animals are. They'd rather be there than any place else. That's, it's a great place. Thank you. Well, we congratulate you and, and we're so proud that you are part of Massachusetts history 
and that you've received this award. Dr. Lightbound, I have only known you a short time, but I do know your emotion in your storytelling and your reporting. And she is a little choked up today because she recognizes all that you've done. And I did get a little bit of a glimpse of the, of the history that you provided when I went to um, the second to last race That's at right. Suffolk, and I was lucky enough to see you at work. Um, I, I feel privileged for that personal glimpse, but more importantly, um, you know, Dr. Lightbound has recognized the contribution you've made to this industry and to all the people who are so much part of that, that um, industry that you both love so much. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. congratulations. Thank you. Well, um, I have to say that our next um, item on the agenda is lunch, but um, because I think I'm allowed to address matters that I didn't reasonably anticipate, I think I have three gentlemen in the back who I'd like to welcome and have them come forward. And I'd love to have Janice Riley come forward too, please. So joining us today is Chair Crosby, who's accessing a chair right now with the help of a crutch. He had, a, had an, a significant operation, but seems to be navigating well, breathing through it. And we have Commissioner McDonald and Commissioner McHugh who have come here because we've been noting this date over the course of several last meetings that today would be Janice's last date. And when you are employee number one, you get some special recognition. <laughs> so before I turn to my immediate colleagues, can we turn to your former colleagues? Um, Mr. Chair, will you like to allow you would you like to go first? I think he wants to go first. I would be privileged. <laughs> There's only one chair, uh, and that would be you, oh. Chair Judd Stein. But as the former chair, I'm pleased to do this. Um, as you can tell, um, I just had hip replacement surgery 10 days ago. This is the first time I've been outside my house. Um, but nothing could have kept me from being here on this particular day. Um, and since Janice and I go way back, I'm just going to take a minute to tell a little bit about that. Uh, we first met 40 years ago, actually almost literally 40, 40 years ago in 1979, when I was Kevin White's campaign manager and she was executive assistant to his chief of staff, uh, Micho Spring. Um, if we got to be friends uh, 40 years ago, that was nice. <laughs> um, she then first came to work with me in 1983 with my publishing company, the Crosby Vandenberg Group. That was a big year. It was the year of my first marriage and the year of Janice's last marriage. <laughs> Congratulations. That was my first marriage, too. <laughs> Congratulations, Steve Cavanaugh. You did it. Um, and we worked together quite a long time with the Crosby Vandenberg Group. Um, then. Janice worked with me a second time in the year 2000 when Governor Salucci asked me to be the Secretary of Administration and Finance, and I had no idea. I said, except for the fact that I know nothing about state administration and finance, I'd be happy to take the job. <laughs> um, so as you have heard, uh, I joined Kathy Judd Stein, who was there at the time. Um, I, uh, first phone call I made uh, was to Janice to see whether she would join me. Um, and she became my chief of staff at the ANF. Um, 
we had a lot of notable experiences there, as we have had over many years. Probably the most notable was we were there in 9-11 together, when the governor, the lieutenant governor, the chief of staff, and almost all the other staff, the state house was empty. Um, the governor and the staff went to the civil defense bunker because nobody knew what was going on, if you remember that morning. And Janice and I and two or three others were supposed to hold the fort for the governor's office in the state house. And as we were sitting there with closed screens, we heard fighter jets going overhead. And we thought, oh my God, you know, could they be coming for the state house too? Um, as it turned out, it was just a uh, National Guard F-16s, but it was a scary and, and memorable moment as it was for, for everybody. Then in the fall of 2001, I got this utterly unexpected and utterly bizarre, bizarre phone call from Governor Patrick asking 2011, the fall of 2011, asking if I would become the founding chair of the Mass Gaming Commission. Um, I said yes. Some of you have heard the story of the governor's chief of staff's reaction to that, which I won't recount now. Um, but when I was accepted, I, uh, my first call was to Janice Riley. And I said to Janice, I'm going to go do this crazy job. Do you have one more in you? And Janice said yes. So Janice was the first employee, as Chairman Judd Stein said, first employee of the Gaming Commission. She sat in a spare office in the Comptroller's office trying to figure out how the hell do you build a gaming commission and a gaming industry. Meanwhile, Jamie and I, who were employees two and three, were still at UMass Boston, happily working away. But from that moment on, Janice uh, was at the center of building this agency and of building a culture at this agency that we could be proud of. Almost from the beginning, all five commissioners uh, who are now here, the original five commissioners, committed to a casino licensing and regulatory process that we characterized as must be participatory, transparent, and fair. That was our central commitment to our work, and nothing has been more central to our work since that moment. Janice, obviously in close collaboration with Elaine Driscoll, come hell or high water, was the guarantor of that commitment to participation and to transparency. No matter how obscure the venue, no matter how insecure the gymnasium, no matter how small the town, no matter how angry the neighbors, no matter how fragile the IT, no matter how funky the audience, even when they worried about bamboo growing all over the place. <laughs> no matter how complicated the logistics for every public meeting was, every public meeting was streamed, every public meeting had mics, every public meeting had chairs, every public meeting had a stenographer, every public meeting was properly noticed, and for every public meeting, every commissioner was properly prepared. This was, I think we would all agree, uh, a virtually flawless and vital logistical performance that made participatory and transparent possible. And oh, by the way, did I mention that Janice orchestrated our moves into three new offices, three new different offices in our first few years seamlessly? That was another virtually flawless and vital logistical performance that made our work possible. And that's just the half of it. Janice provided a discreet shoulder to lean on in times of stress, wise counsel to us as commissioners and to the staff as we tried to meet the challenge of building the plane as we were also flying it. And on a personal note, Janice provided strong and honest and thoughtful advice and sometimes admonitions to the commission chair, that was me, who sometimes saw standards as more onerous than they really were, or sometimes saw rules as silly when they really weren't. Thank you for saving my ass. Um, Here we go. <laughs> I asked Janice Riley in late 2011 whether she had one more big jo job in her, the answer to that question has been clear, hell yes. Thank you, Janice, for your friendship, your integrity, your relentless can-do spirit, and your infinite patient professionalism. I love you.
Commissioner who, who wants to follow that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Commi yeah. Commissioner McDonald can handle it. I mean, Commissioner uh, uh, McHugh, I think, is, can handle it. I'm sure you can, too. I can't compete. No, yeah, you can. I can't compete with that, <laughs> um, and I'm not going to try. Oh, technology. Janice, how, how do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> Call Janice. Uh, yeah. I just asked for her help. Um, I, didn't, I don't have that long history with Janice. None of us did. But the history I have uh, had with her um, uh, was enormously valuable. You know, I can remember the, the day we walked into uh, the building, that first building we had on uh, whatever street it was. I'm getting old, 84 State. There you are. That's why I, you're so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Call Janice. And, and we walked into a building, into a room, a huge room. There were six of us, seven, six or seven of us walked into that room. There was nothing there. And uh, that's how I, uh, I felt that day. We, we, I was excited, I was eager. I hadn't a clue as to how to get started. And looking around this big empty room, one, one of my uh, uh, grandchildren visited later and said we could go bowling here. <laughs> I thought that was a good idea. We never brought it up. We never followed it up. Um, but slowly uh, and, and with increasing speed, Janice um, engineered putting together the physical space at the same time she was putting together the relationship and helping to put together the relationship between uh, the commissioners. We were all strangers to each other. We'd had some time to get together um, after we were appointed, but we didn't know each other well. And she helped uh, enormously with that. And she continued to do that. And she did all of the things that Steve um, so ably um, uh, mentioned here in, and was the, the, the valuable piece of all of, of all of that. But for me, the, the, the major uh, thing that I take away is that in every organization, you, you'll find people with titles, you'll find people with, on the organization chart, you'll find people with, with a, responsibilities that are defined. But you'll always need, in order for an effective organization to really hum, somebody who is the go-to person, somebody who, when things get tough, uh, you can go to for advice. Somebody who's not afraid to, and uh, knows how to, say to, somebody with a title, you, you made a bad call there. Or somebody um, uh, is uh, wounded because of something you said. Or something isn't quite right here. And let's help you fix it. And that's an essential ingredient of a high performance organization. And we became a high performance organization. We had, we had a few bumps in the road. <laughs> but we became a high performance organization. And we did it because we were dedicated to it, but because, as I look back on this, Janice was there to perform that function, and she performed it time and time again for all of us. She was the glue that kept the organization together in tough times. She was there with advice. She was calm. She was gentle in her upbraiding, but firm. And she was uh, an... Uh, indispensable ingredient of the success that we uh, achieved mm -hmm. and as Steve said of the culture that was created one in which everybody truly believes and can recite their belief in the notion that the Commission is to be tr participatory transparent and fair so I think and, and I know uh, on a personal level that there were a number of times when I benefited enormously from those talents, that gentleness, that firmness, and that fearlessness in addressing the problems uh, that were occurring. So thank you, Janice, for what you did to me, for me personally. Thank you for what you did to build this commission into the organization that it is today. And thank you for doing all of that uh, for the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Madam Chairman uh, and Commissioners, uh, I came to the Commission with undoubtedly um, the greatest challenge that anybody uh, has come to work at the Commission um, had, and that was to be the successor to the gentleman on my left. Because uh, I was appointed by the Attorney General to fill the unexpired term of, uh, of Judge uh, uh, McHugh. It became apparent uh, to me very quickly um, how close uh, Janice was uh, to Jim. And I remember in particular a photograph uh, <laughs> in her office in which um, uh, she was in an ice house uh, a restaurant. <coughs> literally an ice house restaurant uh, uh, with Jim and his wife and uh, uh, Janice and her husband and one of the troopers. Was it Dean? Dean. Dean. <laughs> Dean and uh, uh, I never did get an invitation Still from, there. Uh, <laughs> uh, from Janice as to, 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 to join her uh, at that restaurant. Um, is that a <laughs> surprise? It melted. <laughs> it melted. It melted. <laughs> uh, but uh, on a uh, on a serious note, that um, from the first day that I came and throughout my two and a half year uh, tenure on the commission, Janice made me feel uh, as if I was in fact a worthy successor uh, to uh, uh, Jim McHugh. And for that, I will always, always be very, very grateful. And so I was pleased to get the call to be able to participate with Steve and, and Jim in honoring you today. Shall I start with at my right? Thank you. Commissioner. Janice. I'll try. Um, Commissioner McDonald, you described that a restaurant as an ice house. I think it was a vodka bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and that actually is part of the beauty of Janice Riley, frankly. Um, you know, I grew up here in Massachusetts, graduated from college, but then I left for 29 years. So coming back, I did not know anything about state government, really not much about Boston, had never worked here. So Janice quickly became my go-to person. I'm in Florida waiting to start. I've been appointed, and I'm calling Janice. Steve said, call Janice. <laughs> so of course I did that. And she, from day one, uh, there was never a question that I asked that she didn't find an answer for if she didn't know it. Um, anything to do with Boston or state government, Janice was invaluable to me in teaching in a way that was Irre irreverent, which I love, by the way. Um, you know, just everything we needed to do, and now that I think about how seamless it all was, my God, I, frankly, you're irreplaceable, Janice. You really are. So we're lucky to get you back two days a week, and we're going to continue to use all those skills seriously. But to think about all we've been through, and God, almost eight years, Janice, employee number one, um, you just made it work. You kept the trains running. You are the glue. Um, in, in a way that for all of us is just, um, you know, it's helpful, but yet it's, but yet it's real, right? It's, Jesus, we have to do it this way. Or just, just telling us, giving your opinion on how things should go and um, what the intelligence was, what the room was like, who was there. Um, I would say, who's this person over there? They looked angry. She goes, oh, you don't know, so, you know. So just was, you were just invaluable to us and really, um, the trains have run really, really well. And um, you know, you may be irreverent, but you care so much about our mission and getting it right, Janice. You know, any time of day and night, you're you're always there to kind of problem solve for us. So I, I can't I can't even think about what this job would have been like with uh, without you there to to really assist. And some of the things we've been through, I know we've uh, we've talked about it a lot, but it's just. Thank you so much, um, Miss. Well, we'll still be friends, by the way. But but <laughs> but but. Have Vodka said bar. That. Uh, yeah. The, well, yeah. I mean, that was that was. We were being kind there, but that's what it was. It was a vodka bar. So. <laughs>
Thank you, Janice. I've loved working with you. We'll miss working with you, although we, we still have a lot of good work to do, so I can't, can't thank you enough, frankly. All right. Commissioner Zuniga. Oh, I'm going to uh, go. I'm, do you I'm want to go uh, of, in uh, I'm thinking in, in, of old to new? Yeah. In, well, in I don't want to say uh, old, <laughs> but I want to say okay. appointment. Am I right? Happy. Am I right? On an appointment, uh, or yeah. is it Commissioner Stebbins would be next? I think it's Commissioner no, I Zuniga. I was appointed, yeah, I was appointed right. third. <laughs> I uh, I had the pleasure of knowing uh, knowing Janice six days before before I voted in the in the meeting uh, for your hiring, which I think it turned out really well, uh, really well for us. Um, I don't know that I have much to add that hasn't been said, uh, except that um, emphasizing uh, some of the points that are critical, uh, helping us get through those very bumpy roads at times and coming out of it much better uh, is, is critical. Uh, helping in the culture that, this, that helps this organization uh, to this day, and I think we'll continue to do that uh, when some of us are, are no longer here, uh, was also critical. Um, uh, and your very benign way of coming to speak truth to power and trying to be persuasive uh, when we needed to be persuaded is also something that we're going to be very thankful for, that I am very thankful for. Uh, so, thank you. Commissioner Stebbins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm mindful I got to say a few things last week when there was no live transcript <laughs> running that um, I won't repeat. Um, I also got to take note that uh, maybe because we're so close to the holidays, I can make the analogy we're being visited by three wise men uh, <laughs> who unfortunately have not shown up with frankincense, myrrh, and any gold. Um, but um, I, I, you know, my colleagues and I, again, uh, all walked into uh, an office space uh, uh, with really Janice and Jamie being part of the team that was going to help us navigate those those early days. Um, I think it's important to point out those hearings that Steve talked about. We were all up on stage. We all had state police around us. It was Janice who was in the back of the room in the line of fire uh, that took a lot of those shots. But um, it's been a pleasure to work with Janice. I consider her a friend, certainly a fellow Red Sox fan. Um, hmm. You know, she, uh, she comes to us every meeting or before every meeting and uh, says, hey, do you have everything? And uh, you missed that this morning, and I'm kind of glad you did. I'm not sure I could have held it together, but thank mm. you so much. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Commissioner O'Brien. Um, so unlike the other three up here that have spoken, I am like, Judge McDonald, where I jumped into the slipstream of a commission already fully in motion. Um, and it can be tough to jump in as it's moving. And I have to say from that perspective, you were no less essential um, to me than you were to the people when, when it was starting out. And you were the person who, as I said last week, when everyone else is off and doing their job, and you're the one who remembered that maybe I might need to know, you know where to park and where to go and <laughs> what time to get on a boat, um, which was very helpful. Um, I, I do also, I had the, the very candid personal conversations with you, you know, that I will miss. Um, the one thing I think that I will miss the most about your presence and your influence is that you don't even need to speak to let me know exactly what you thought of what just came out of my mouth. <laughs> and so to, to think of January 9th, to look in the back of the room, to not see that, to gauge how I'm doing and to not see the touchstone that for me lets me know what's going on is, um, is going to be very different, and I'm, I'm sure we will survive as an organization, but we will be um, that much um, less in that regard until we find someone who can help us keep going. So I will miss you, and I thank you very much, and I, I wish you uh, fun and wine and enjoyment in your retirement. <laughs> Good job. So it's not lost on any of us that many of your colleagues have come in as much as they wanted to see the, the former commissioners and chair, they're here to honor you. We were really lucky last week um, in, the, in the public meeting to present the McHugh Award.
to Janice as Ed described. And we did have a chance to make comments and embarrass Janice. But I thought it would be really nice to do this while we're streaming. <laughs> fairly, <laughs> fairly, transparently, and with great participation. <laughs> so um, I guess that I would comment that I did have the privilege of, of knowing Janice when she worked for then Secretary Crosby. And, and I was in the governor's legal office. Um, Janice was the person that many people kind of said, oh, I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you go ask. <laughs> but um, immediately, immediately I, I knew that that was sort of that Charlestown smart and I could handle my Vermont naivety and we could um, communicate well. And, I missed Janice after you became Chief of Staff of the Governor's Office. We, we missed her presence, but I was lucky enough to occasionally bump into her. And then after Steve left UMass and came here, I, I commented the other day how I had bumped into you at a very fortuitous time. Chair Crosby had already told me, oh, everything has to be done in public meeting and, and we can't choose the carpet without talking about it publicly. But Janice supplied more detail and said to me, Kathy, I have to monitor the commissioner's restroom stops <laughs> to make sure that there's not three of them in the bathroom <laughs> violating the open meeting law. <laughs> and I said, good luck with that, Jim. <laughs> but Janice, for me here, and that's the critical piece because I'm saying goodbye to you as a number one employee and I think we think the number, the first employee to retire from the commission, we think, we believe that to be the case. In any case, lots of number ones all around. Like Eileen, um, I came on at a time when things were quite complicated. And I had the benefit of you having your judgment and your insight and your care to work with me to be however successful I could be at that time when it was complicated. And I was so lucky to know I could rely on that. And that was um, a gift. And I was, and you know, it, all three of the former commissioners had told me that I would have that, but I already knew that you being there would make all the difference to me. You do have those smarts that have you know, eyes on the back of your head that make us all really, really acutely aware. But it's not just sensitive issues. It's you know, all those issues of, of being a good colleague and being, um, being there for each other. And you've been all of that for me in the short time. So on a personal note, I'm going to miss you very, very much. But on a professional note, and Judge McHugh, you, you um, and I share the same sentiment. You're a very, very good friend, and you've been a great friend to, um, to Steve. I think he, she might have been the reason for your success throughout your career. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just saying. I, <laughs> but, um, you know, you're, as we said, you're personally so good to everyone. But you have really served the Commonwealth and the public. And for that, we are eternally grateful. So thank you. And I wish you well in your retirement. And if you happen to do a little bit more public service, we'll welcome it. But um, try to get on that sailboat with that husband of yours and, uh, and, and enjoy. And uh, we know that we will see you um, a, as a friend and in whatever form you, you want to continue serving the public. Good luck. So um, we are still in our official meeting. I'm going to, oh, I'm, I'm going to allow Janice to speak. I just wanted to let everybody know we are still in our official meeting. We will be concluding after Janice's remarks for lunch. Um, I wanted to um, just this is a logistic note that I'll Janice would no Janice would, <laughs> Janice would tell me that, um, and uh, at, after Janice's remarks, it will be um, 
will be returning a little bit later than our, our plan, probably closer to 140, 45 to 2 um, for our um, second half of our meeting. And now, um, before Janice makes her remarks, Could you come up, Janice, to this awkward place, please? Where am I? You want me here, right? And, um, the, the mic is on, and, and that's Elaine Driscoll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is actually as much of a presentation from the commission. It's really a, com a presentation, too, from your colleagues. I'll read it into the microphone. Um, Janice Riley, it's on the 19th day of December 2019, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission proudly presents to you this Distinguished Service Award. In grateful appreciation of her distinguished service to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Janice's efforts as Chief Administrative Officer have been instrumental in the Commission's ability to successfully build a new public agency while simultaneously implementing a new and complex expanded gaming law. The Commission thanks her for all she has done for Commissioners, MGC staff, and MGC's many stakeholders. Upon her retirement from the Commonwealth, the MGC extends its heartfelt gratitude for her measurable and immeasurable contribution, consummate professionalism, and admirable dedication to public service. Maybe your rightful place all along. Oh no, oh no. As we all know, you know where I like to sit at the back of the room. Um, Again, I am humbled by all of your words. Um, when Steve called to say, do you have one more in you? I had no idea what it was going to involve, <laughs> thank God, because I probably would not have said yes. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> it has been a privilege, an honor, and a pleasure to work with all of my colleagues who are here. Um, We've been, we've come a long way since 2012 when we started this journey at 84 State Street. Um, and I'm very proud of all we've accomplished and uh, walk away kind of bittersweet about it, but happy and proud of all we've done. And I couldn't have done it without all of you. I was so fortunate when we first started to get five commissioners who did not know one another at all, but who were willing to just roll up their sleeves and dig in, and none of us really knew anything about the industry, but uh, we all kind of learned together. And um, it's been the journey of a lifetime, I can say that honestly, and again, proud of all that we've accomplished, and grateful for the colleagues and people that I've worked with over the years. It, None of it, again, I said this the other day, would have been possible without all of your efforts. Um, you've been incredible. Anytime I asked for help or uh, needed to have assistance with anything, there were many, many hands that were put out to help me, and I will be grateful for that forever. Um, I'm not going to say goodbye. I'm going to say see you soon, and thank you all, and thank you all to all the commissioners, all the commissioners. Thank you, and, and we'll convene um, at we'll convene at one forty-five. Thank you. We That's <laughs> <laughs> great. Right. 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 Right.
Um, we're reconvening commission meeting number 284. And we are now turning to happily item number eight. And happily because we have a wonderful group of guests here today. Mars. Great. Good afternoon, commissioners and chair. Um, I'm going to just go down the line and, and um, introduce the, the guests in our first row and then um, Teresa will come up for part two and she will introduce our guests in the, in the second row. So I um, am joined by Marlene Warner, Executive Director of the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling, uh, Ray Fluett, who is um, the Senior Game Sense Advisor at Encore Boston Harbor, Josh well, new. I got that right. Who is a GSA Game Sense Advisor at Encore Boston Harbor, and and David Tang, who is also a Game Sense Advisor at Encore Boston Harbor. Um, Welcome. So uh, Teresa did a very good job of scripting this presentation, and she's given me two minutes um, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're already so, a minute in. <laughs> no, it starts right now, Commissioner. Mark, the clock is on. <laughs> I can say a lot about GameSense, but um, there are a few points that I think I really want to, to make. Um, this commission introduced GameSense four years ago. Um, as it, at the time, I considered a solution for a piece of the statute that called for an on-site space. What we have created since that time is a, a program that means something, that it provides information to patrons at probably one of the most important times where they could be making these decisions, it provides them with information so they can make an informed choice about their gambling decisions. Um, we are growing a body of evidence that supports the idea that the patrons at our Massachusetts casinos our patrons at our Massachusetts casinos are, are taking in information and using that information and it's informing their, their play. Um, and it's informing their, their, their play to keep their gambling safe. Our Game Sense advisors are providing information to persons who are also considered at risk where their gambling behavior is risky or they're experiencing um, a, a degree of harm as a result of their gambling, and they're, they are there at that pivotal time of, of their life and providing them with information and resources to, to get help. That's much more than just a solution to, to something. That's, that, that is something that, that means something. We won't stop um, doing that core function, but um, we have an incredibly talented team that is dedicated to improving this service as well. How can we do a better job of providing that information um, at that point in time so that the, the patrons can, can, um, can stay in a zone of playing safe? This is, this is something that's moving from where 10 years ago the solution for responsible gaming was making sure that brochures were available to one where we're talking about different segments of players. We're talking about providing information to different players based upon their needs and their, their level of play. We're moving from something that, that was a brochure to something that is science. And that is, is incredibly important work. Um, and the individuals that are here today um, represent some of the best of that work. It's two minutes. So, um, um, I'm excited to turn it over to Marlene Warner, who, um, from day one of developing the Game Sense program, um, has contributed to developing this this program. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. I am really pleased to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, what has been happening over the last six months. Uh, obviously, a very large piece happened, which is we opened a new Game Sense Information Center uh, while a new casino within a new casino opening, and that was obviously at Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, this is our largest team uh, across the three properties. We currently have 10 staff members there. We opened with uh, 12, and one of the things we talked to you about uh, when we came just just two weeks ago, four weeks ago, whenever we were here, um, was about being adept uh, and uh, um, 
changing with what we saw was happening. And one of the things we realized is that we didn't need some of our part-time staff. And we're going to, uh, Ray will talk a little bit more about kind of the day-to-day -day operations uh, at uh, Encore Boston Harbor. But um, I'm so pleased that we have some of the folks here. Uh, so let me talk to you a little bit about how we developed that team. We've learned a lot. Uh, when we opened at P Plain Ridge Park Casino, we, not unlike probably everyone, and Lisa can probably speak to this, we're kind of just figuring it out as we are going. Um, I think someone alluded to earlier this morning, uh, you know, kind of trying to figure things out as the ship was moving. Uh, we were doing the same thing. And uh, so we've learned tremendously about what our staff need, what they need in terms of uh, infrastructure, what they need in terms of things as simple as, as um, our, our um, way we are dressed today. This is the official uniform of Encore Boston Harbor um, and uh, uh, Game Sense Center. And, um, and really how we best train them and support them in that initial orientation, but also in that ongoing um, uh, lead into a casino opening. So there are four weeks of training, and that's often shocking to people to know that we spend that much time, but we think it's vital. Um, the, the staff have been recruited almost exclusively from uh, the casino industry. So we have staff, and you'll hear a little bit about some of the background of some of the folks we have here today, but from our regional casinos, both here in Massachusetts and in uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island. And they come with, uh, and again, you heard me say this a few weeks ago, come with an, an immense amount of um, skill when it comes to assessing what's going on around them, being able to connect with all kinds of patrons, um, knowing games inside and out. But they all come with uh, the understanding of how to lead someone to gamble, and not necessarily how to explain the games, how to engage someone in a conversation about odds that would then lead someone to um, reflect on their own gambling behavior. And so that is something that really needed to be taught and needed to be practiced. So we spent four weeks with our team, uh, most of which was actually at the Envision Hotel in um, Everett. Uh, and uh, that was an opportunity for them to learn things like motivational interviewing. How do you spend time with someone and start to lead them towards um, a conversation about, um, again, reflecting on their own behavior and making, making a decision to change um, a problematic behavior for them. We led them through conversations around um, you know, we may have somebody who's an, uh, someone who's an expert in slots but doesn't know much about roulette making sure they know those games inside and out. And some of that is, is teaching across um, uh, the individuals. We have a lot of experts in a lot of things, um, but also bringing in a lot of information. Uh, I think one of the things that was really key, and Mark uh, touched on this, is making sure they understand what the data that has been collected. And so this is kind of a perfect segue from your earlier presentation from uh, uh, Dr. Volberg and her team, is what do we know already and how can we apply that to the work of game sense and so that has been one of the things that we've learned right what do we know about um, players in massachusetts their their behaviors what do we know about average spend what do we know about their casino play versus their lottery play all those things have been um, expressed to the game sense advisors and kind of broken down so we can figure out what does this mean about the day-to-day -day interactions again those are things that are happening in those uh, four weeks in addition, a lot of time was spent on making sure that they know how to have a positive experience with every person they encounter, no matter what that person presents with. So that could look like um, someone who's uh, concerned and troubled when they come into a voluntary self-exclusion pr um, program. Uh, that could look like as somebody who is uh, engaging as a family member in the casino. That could look like, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time also training them to um, be able to go out and do trainings and engagement, community engagement and outreach uh, out in the, in the uh, host and surrounding communities to the uh, casino. So the Encore team, I think, benefited, and we actually brought some of our team members from some of the other GameSense Information Centers in, because I think we've finally gotten it right. I think we um, know um, the sweet spot in terms of um, where um, they need to spend the most time and where they need the most practice, and then what are some of those booster shots that we need to continue to provide uh, moving forward, and we continue to do that and hone in on that. Um, as I said, we uh, have our team from uh, across the gaming industry, and yet uh, they 
I often think they all could go back and, and have a second career as clinicians. Um, they are uh, really sympathetic. They are open to hearing different approaches and um, practice them. So I'm going to turn it over to Ray, who can really give you a better sense as to what did the Encore opening look like. Um, but now you know a little bit about the background of our team members. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my focus um, really when we first started uh, opening Encore and going there was um, the team members that Encore has, the staff that they have there to try to make sure that they are really in tune with the Game Sense program. Because um, as you can see from my bio, my history is from table games. And in the many, many years that I've been in the industry, um, I didn't, never heard anything about responsible games. Um, we never went through any kind of training for it. it we um, just really thought that the casino didn't care. You know, that's the way it was. And it, it's probably still like that in plenty of places other than Massachusetts here. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, so when I went there, I didn't want um, these casinos, that the, the casino workers that they're hiring to still have that. Uh, feeling that they can't talk to a guest. They can't say it's time to take a break. They can't say, well, you know what? There is a voluntary self-exclusion program. So between training these guys at the same time, we were trying to engage with the uh, uh, new hires that Encore is bringing in. So we were part of their orientation process. And uh, for the first three weeks prior to opening, Lynn Ho, my senior game sense advisor and myself, were able to engage with 3,500 of their employees. Mm -hmm. And with that, we go through the training and I'm hearing from these employees how it's okay, I'm not gonna get in trouble if I tell somebody that, you know what, you might need to take a break today. You know, it's okay that um, I could send them over to the Gibson Center, you know, there is a voluntary self-exclusion program. I know where the center is located. And uh, it was really good to hear that from them because your, your employees are people too. They're not machines. They're not a slot machine. They have the feelings. I mean, I could tell you many stories from my own personal experience of how I felt my hands were tied with a person that is really, you can tell they're distraught and they're spending their last dime here and uh, neglecting family and to come to a program like this is really, I mean, full turnaround for me. And uh, I wanted to share that with the staff. And another reason why I really wanted to do it is because Encore is going to have hundreds of thousands of guests coming in there. And I have a, a staff of 10. How do I engage with these guests? You know, how can I make it work where I can uh, get my staff of 10 to get out there and try to be the front line. And it sometimes doesn't work that way. You get the employees to be the front line. You know, they are the ones, the dealer is hearing the story from the uh, player. Uh, they're here, the slot attendant is seeing the same person every day and they're, they're building the relationships with these people. And uh, then they're getting us in tune to it and knowing that, you know what, you might want to come over and talk to this person. You know, so it's really, really a good thing. Since opening, um, it became more difficult with the trainings to um, engage with the people that have already started prior to us getting involved. And so we went from four trainings a month to over 20 a month. And, and those, because they're working in a 24-hour industry, our trainings had to range from like 7 in the morning to midnight. You know, so um, I had to call upon my staff that just got hired to, you know what, I need help. You know, so these guys really stepped up. Our training that we did, as Molly uh, told you earlier, the four weeks, we also went into how to do presentations. And then Encore really did a real special thing where they um, held a train-the-trainer class strictly for game sets. And um, I jumped at that opportunity. Yes, you want to do that? You know, we're all over it. And I was able to even invite um, game sense advisors from the other properties, from MGM and PPC, to come and actually go through the training. And it, it helped them immensely. So now when they're getting in front of 50 to 100 people at a time and 
talking about the program, something they're very passionate about, they can feel comfortable talking to all these people. And on a daily basis, we get, um, I want to say we did 110 uh, voluntary self-exclusions so far since the uh, casino has opened, and about half of them stem from an Encore employee setting the person on us. Whether it's a security guard escorting them over to the center, or a slot attendant or a dealer suggesting the program, or even um, red card, you know, on a daily basis. Red card sends people over to us that are just signing up for um, a new card. And they're saying, you know what, why don't you go over and see the Game Sense Center? You know, they really have something special. They could program to show you, and they can also um, give you something. You're not going to walk away empty handed. <laughs> You know, not everybody gets those game sense socks, you know, that we have. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a really good thing. And um, and every small interaction with a person, whether it's just giving them a little piece of swag or something, all of a sudden they say, "What is game sense?" And that's where we're able to go into our full field. And we don't lead them with um, your we're about responsible gambling. That's not our first focus. Uh, we, we say, you know what? We're all about keeping gambling fun, you know? And that's what we're at, you know? And if I use the word responsible gambling, problem gambling, anything like that, a lot of times they're gonna put the hand up and walk away. You know, they don't wanna hear it, it's not for me. But if we're talking about we're keeping gambling fun, you know, and exciting and using your entertainment budget and I can go further into it, and uh, we, we'll actually talk about the games in the house edge with you, you know. We can tell you where the house edge is built into every gate and show you how a slot machine works and how random it is and, and what you've just done on this particular spin on a roulette wheel doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna change what happened in the next spin. And in explaining this stuff to people and their eyes just open up. You know, so it all starts off with a little hi, how you doing, and it works into a full game sense presentation. You know, and we can do this in just a few minutes too. So it's very exciting. Um, Encore, it's a great property to work in. I'm very happy. It's, I've worked at all three of them. You know, <laughs> I hope this is the last one. It's like I, I can't continue to move <laughs> like I am. But uh, I mean, it is fun, and I. Um, have a great staff that uh, is really, really engaged in the program. Um, one, like Molly, Molly had said, our focus was to pick up people with gaming knowledge and gaming background. But really, it's to me, was about customer service. You know, how to be able to talk to people and, and let them feel that, you know what, you're not trying to sell them something but you're really servicing them and making them feel good about themselves and you can spread our message in that way. So I did bring a couple of shining stars with me here today. <laughs> you know, I have uh, <laughs> David Tang and Josh Molyneux and uh, they're here to talk about themselves. So, go ahead, Josh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. When I first heard about GameSense, it was actually during my orientation to be an assistant food court manager at Plain Ridge Park Casino. And when I heard about it, I thought, this is a cool idea, but how could you actually incorporate this? Like, how could I actually use this in my daily life? So while I was working there, I'd have regulars coming up every day that I would always have a good time talking to, and it was nice to see them. But in the back of my mind, I was always kind of sad because that generally means, so you're at this casino for hours every day, and you're telling me about how you're losing money, and I, wasn't really in a comfortable enough space to feel like I could talk to them about it. And then I heard that GameSense was hiring. And I actually started to talk to Ray and Ronnie, who works at Playing Rich Moore, to hear more about the mission and exactly what GameSense does. And so I applied, got the job, and then I started working at Encore Boston Harbor, which I found very interesting, because ironically, when I was there, I'd start talking to other employees at the casino, and they would all go, I mean, what do you guys do? Just ban people, just help people have gambling problems? And I went, okay, I can understand because that's exactly what I thought. So it's been very interesting to watch how this program has grown with knowledge of the different members that work at the casino because there was one instance, for example, where someone came to the casino after five years. They'd stopped gambling, they'd almost lost their home, 
they had to borrow money from their grandmother just to keep going and staying stable in life. And they wanted to just celebrate and check out the casino because it just opened. They thought it would be cool. I get a call from security, which I never imagined would happen because they were always scoffing at the idea, saying, can you come over to this location and speak to this person? It sounds like they need to talk about their gambling habits. So I brought her over to the Game Sense Center, and as we were talking, we were just talking about the different things that happened with her, what she had lost, what she was afraid of losing, and how she had rebuilt her life after these five years and was scared that she was going to throw it all away. So as the conversation goes on, she continues to reveal that she was that day supposed to go to GA to give a speech about not gambling for five years and how it had saved her life and made it so much better and showed how much appreciation she had for Game Sense for being there to help her exclude herself so she wouldn't have to go through that process again. And it made me think back to when I originally started at Plain Ridge about kind of scoffing at the idea and realized how cool it was that this was really a multi-level sort of deal. Instead of being a place that people go to just when they have a gambling issue or they have to continue going, it was a place that you can go when you start going to casinos and we could teach you how to avoid that and how to understand how the games work. If you felt like you were getting to a level where it was getting out of your control, we could help you exclude yourself and we could help you make sure you don't get into that area. And then for the people who actually had gone through the issues before and realized that the pattern's about to repeat, we could help them as well. So it really came home to me how great of a program it is because of just the multi-level layer in which we can help people overcome these different issues and almost as a preventative measure before it even starts. And it's also just fun because you go to the casino now and all the people that originally kind of laughed at the idea, you're joking around with talking about how great of a program this is and all the different, different actions they've seen and shown why GameSense is so important. So that's been my experience so far. So I think it's an excellent program. It's my favorite job I've ever had. And I'd love to keep this whole thing going. That's right? great. Thank you. I'll, I'll scoot right. down. Come on, you can do it. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, thank you, Josh. It's going to be tough to follow that. All right. Um, my you name is David You may be able Tang. to move your, you may oh. be able to move it. Like this? To, to help yeah. you, yeah. Better? I'm just following the instructions. All right. Do not pull the microphone towards you. Does it say? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that. <laughs> No, but ours says that's something else, which I occasionally remember to read. You're better. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So my first, uh, my first experience with gambling was when my, um, well, both my parents are, have had issues with problem gambling in the past. And my first encounter with gambling or with the casino industry was probably at the age of 13. Right, and my mom had been a casino table game stealer for quite a while, so I've seen both the good and the bad sides of the casino industry and uh, the gaming industry. Um, you know, she continued to have an ongoing problem, and you know, when I heard about Game Sense, I had been working at MGM Springfield, and it just it seemed like a call to action for me uh, because you know there there's no such program in Connecticut. Right. Um, at best, they have a 1-800 number, maybe, maybe a little card. I don't think it's even a brochure that says, if you need help, call this number. Right. Um, it's also, GameSense is unique in that it's neutral on gambling. It's not adversarial in that, in that way. I feel like a lot of gamblers are afraid to reach out because they're afraid to be judged on the morals, to be judged on a lack of willpower, you know, um, to be just judged as a person. So they shy away from any anti-gambling programs or strategies. So the fact that Game Sense is more about understanding and compassion, more about education, more about health and prevention, you know, I think that makes such a huge difference. Um, just recently, we had a lady who was a local, a patron that was coming to the casino basically every week, um, multiple times a week. Uh, she was from the next town over in Chelsea, and she had gotten to know every single Game Sense advisor at the Encore property by name, right? Um, and so she obviously enjoyed gambling. She enjoyed talking to the Game Sense advisors. And she started encountering a little bit of a problem with her gambling habits, where she was spending more money than she was comfortable with. And she had to cut back on her food budget. You know, it's, um, it's a relatively common story. But this story had a happy ending. Because after going through this for weeks on end, finally, it just clicked. You know, 
somebody said something to her and all the pieces of the puzzle fit together and she understood and decided I have to leave at some point you know it's all well and good that I'm having fun but I have to set a budget I have to set a time limit for myself and she completely transitioned into healthier gambling habits into more sustainable gambling habits so she didn't stop altogether and part of the research shows and you know, I'm so grateful that we have all this training to help us understand this because I personally learned a lot even though I've been around gambling and gaming since age 13 I learned a lot when I joined Game Sense um, that a lot of problem gamblers don't stop gambling right they continue gambling throughout their lifetime but sometimes they transition to a more sustainable healthier version where they're not spending their you know daily you know bread food water rent all that stuff and they're not spending their entire paychecks every single time they engage in any of these activities so she came over to us she was telling us how happy she was you know and that she was leaving you know exactly even <laughs> uh, it can be a challenge sometimes right um but hearing that seeing that happen live you know it gives me a lot of hope for the gaming industry because i i know that uh over time there's only going to be more and more casinos opening up there's going to be more states more areas that are going to be legalizing gambling so unless we find a healthy way to incorporate into society it, it can do a lot of harm right so um, another case in point is that we work really, really well with a lot of the employees at Encore, right? When they first started, uh, they weren't really sure what GameSense was about, but now we're having day-to-day -day conversations with uh, some of the security officers because, you know, some of them are allowed to gamble, and they talk to us about their gambling habits and some of them about their gambling problems, right? So the fact that they feel comfortable enough to have that conversation, I think, speaks volumes. It's tremendous, you know, where... In the past, it might have been taboo. It's not something you want to openly admit, and people feel a lot of shame and embarrassment over it. Now it's seen as the responsible thing to do, right? At least that's the culture we're trying to foster. So, you know, I'm I'm really I'm really happy to be part of the Game Sense team, and uh, for every little bit that I can contribute, I'm really excited to see where this program is going to go in the future. That's great. That's great. I have just one. One other anecdotal story that these guys have dozens, but um, two weeks ago I got a call on the voluntary self-exclusion line from uh, a, a man at Encore Boston Harbor. Um, it originally went to voicemail. I called him back about an hour later, um, and I could hear the slot machines in the background. He said, you know, I'm 75, and I'm worried that I'm going to lose, lose all my money. Um, he was inquiring about what to do. I, I talked to him for a little bit. I tried to describe where the Game Sense Information Center was. I said, you can talk to a staff. You, you know, I, I tried to encourage him to, to make his way over there. Um, I hung up. I wasn't convinced that he was going to try to, he was going to figure that out. So I called, um, called Julie Hines, who is the director of, of Responsible Gaming, explained. I said, could you just pass along? Look out for this guy if he comes to the Game Sense Information Center. Um, he reached out to me, and it would be great if he could get some help. Um, you know, so I got I spoke to Julie last week, and I found out that Ray had actually gone out onto the gaming floor, walked the floor, and found this person, um, and brought him back to the Game Sense Information Center. That there was a lot of concern about this is a huge gaming floor game sense is just kind of a, a drop in the bucket how are we going to be effective at, at doing this but the idea that we have you know thank you so much ray for for taking the steps to go out there and actually look around find this person and really make that difference um it was it's just a great story of of the great work that they do to go that extra mile and was that in part because of the referral, the general characteristics, a 75-year-old yeah, man yeah. Uh, or something like that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's several out there, but, you know, I think, I, I mean, I would venture to say Ray kind of knows what to look for. Right. He knows, he knows not only age, but signs of distress. And, um, and, uh, and he went out and found him. Right. Really, that, that was it. Uh, he, uh, he wasn't gambling. When I uh, when I saw him, you know, I walking around and um, he did say 75 years old, and I mean we're not Plainridge Park here, 
so uh, that we uh, we do have a younger demographic uh, there. So it was kind of easy to walk around and and pick him out of a crowd. Um, he he was walking around. He had all papers. He had everything in front of him about our program, you know, uh, and it, it did make it very easy for me to find him. But he was very happy to do it, and he he actually found out about our program and everything from uh, Plainridge Park. Uh, after talking to him, he he frequented there often, and he got to know Terrence, one of our game sense advisors, there very well. And he told me to tell Terrence that he finally did it. You know, finally excluded. That's great. That's great. Great story. Mm -hmm. Me, you? Yeah, you go ahead. I, okay. Commissioner <laughs> Cameron, first of all, I love the uniforms. You all look so professional and sharp. I really do. They look great. So we I know you haven't tell. always felt that way about the uniforms. Well, I know that. I know that. This is a different uniform, and it really looks, it looks terrific. It really does. A couple of things I heard that I think are so impressive. First is 50% um, of the referrals are from um, Encore Boston Harbor employees. That's amazing. And that's to your point that it wasn't always that way. Right. So I think that's terrific that we have Lisa sitting with the team. So, I mean, I think it's a partnership, right? Yeah. Um, you wouldn't be as successful without um, the licensees embracing the concept and, you know, working with us to make it successful. So I, I just love hearing those stories. And um, your, your personalities are... Uh, engaging, infectious. I can see why you're all so successful. I think we're so lucky to have all of you. Marlene, great job recruiting. Yep. Really impressive team. Um, so I really appreciate you coming and spending the time with us just to explain and to talk about the work you're doing and how important it is. And it really is important. So, and Ray, I'm sorry, that wasn't that easy to do. Go, <laughs> and at the size of that casino to go find one gentleman, wow, that was. That means yeah. you, you, you care, really. That's what right. it tells me. And um, I'm sure you made a difference in, in his life. So thank you. You're uh, Thank you. Thank you for, um, for those updates. We have had a number of, uh, as part of the procurement, uh, you know, in their response, the Mass Council had, uh, you know, very well articulated uh, principles that now the Game Sense Advisors begin to articulate in real life anecdotes and experience, which is really, uh, really good. That's that's the crux of what you're all trying to do there. Um, you know, we have fancier words, uh, but the, 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 you know, like step care approach, trying to talk to different people and try to meet them where they are, but you clearly know how to engage that way and, and, and do it effectively. Um, the talk down of responsible gaming, instead the focus on positive play is something that is beginning to really be implemented as I hear you talk about how you're engaging with people, which is critical. Uh, it's really, in my opinion, one of the cornerstones of the success of this, of this program. And, um, and I did want to mention something about the prior evaluation, something that I think that we are gearing towards, towards doing. In the first evaluation that we did on this program, which I, now looking back, would appear to be a little earlier than ideal, maybe we did it a little too soon, there was a real uh, um, uh, principle at the time to try to, you know, do it, we're doing a pilot program and it's something new and let's try to evaluate it. Uh, but as, as we now look forward to the next evaluation, um, one of the things that came from that first evaluation was that intuitively the number of interactions seemed to, to, to be a metric, um, which I, I believe still is a, a metric. It's not the only metric. Uh, I believe the quality of interactions um, and the timing, like the ones you, you say, at critical times um, are really key. You need many interactions, you need many hellos and good mornings and, and so on to be able to reach those critical times. And that's something that I, that I look forward how we try to begin to measure and quantify those, uh, those critical, both quality uh, um, and, and, and the critical timing of, of certain interactions. Um, and um, 
I, I, I should also uh, uh, mention uh, something that I think uh, you put really well, Ray, which is uh, how we leverage those uh, interactions. When you talk about how you are um, uh, through the dealers that you also know, that you also interact quite a bit with other employees at, at, uh, in the hospitality piece, but parts of the casino. Um, because you know them because they're former colleagues or because they have, they're doing work that you've done before. Uh, this notion of ultimate referrals is something that's a theme in the program that I think we really need to look forward to. Internal referrals, just like the one you described well, uh, Mark, which is a very powerful anecdote, by the way, uh, but between employees and GameSense advisors, uh, but then also to external resources, which is also a big part of what, what I think the program is, is, needs to accomplish. How we make warm handoffs um, to existing resources outside of the, of the, of the, of the casino there's critical resources there, including the voluntary self-exclusion uh, piece. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's really the, the, the future of the program, uh, and it's something that I know you have put a lot of thought in. Uh, I, it, it comes um, uh, full circle, uh, as I've heard you say in your uh, response to the RFP, that a big focus w uh, was going to, to be your interactions with employees. That's what you really wanted to increase um, as a real measurable goal. Um, I think it's something that's, that's exciting uh, about the program, that, uh, that is a focus. And it's very good to hear, and, uh, 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 you know, in, in your own words, what you're confronting on the front lines, uh, which are all those concepts that I, that I speak about. I, I would just. Did you want to? I'm sorry. She wanted, maybe she wanted to respond a little. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for that. I, I um, think one of the things that we failed to talk about was how important um, it has been for us to uh, really look at, through our senior GSAs and the staff at um, the physical environment and and what what are the where are the best places for us to have interactions? Where are the best places for us to talk with employees? How do we set ourselves up? Um, you know, these folks were talking, uh, I think it was just last week, about, oh, you know, maybe we should be focused on making sure we always have it at, um, you know, staff changeovers, being in back of the house, always having someone kind of strategically stationed there. I think these are the things that we're trying to figure out is not just the number of interactions, but where are the best interactions happening and what are the conversation pieces that are happening there and what do we need to equip ourselves with? Is it best for us to be standing in that strategic place with an iPad, with a brochure, with swag? What is going to make for, and I think those are the things we're really honing in on right now. And so it's, that's to me is that game since 2.0 next level. Um, and I will say that it's, um, it's been invaluable to have uh, the senior GSA is working together. Uh, Julie Hines, our director of responsible gambling, has done a nice job of really building that senior team up so that they are really exchanging ideas and thoughts um, across those properties. So while there's a lot of consistency, we also are making sure we're uh, um, capturing what's unique about each property and each game sense information center and really going with what works uh, in those places. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that when we talk about Responsible Gambling Education Week, um, which uh, happened in early August. But I think that um, that, you know, the, when the RFR was put out, the, you know, the, there was a question about whether it made sense to have um, one program run one center versus another program running another center. We have found that it has been invaluable for us to have that consistency in branding and programming but to um, also think about how do we um, do something very specific for the, for the patrons, for the staff, for where we are. We're located in three really different spots in the three casinos, right? We have signage in really different ways in the three casinos. Our staff are really good at trying to maneuver around those different environments and figuring out how, um, how to make that work best. So. And I, I, I should mention some, something else uh, that the review committee talked about when we talked about um, number of interactions versus equality. There's clear. There's a clear recognition that uh, we, we do not want to simply drive interactions uh, because that's one measure. 
Um, you need to be able to ascertain who is ready to have any kind of interaction. Right. You don't want to turn people off. Otherwise, at least it, it could theoretically back, backfire. Uh, and if, if, if you're perceived to be pushy just to get interactions. Okay. Um, and that's the whole side of, you know, uh, um, looking at the quality, uh, um, but also, you know, the benefit of having all of you guys mostly come from the hospitality and gaming industry where you both know, um, you know, the players, the psyche, the uh, designs, um, and, and, and so on. Thank you. Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, I would just add, I want to go back to a point Mark made um, when you think about what the statute originally said. I think a lot of us had, I had personally two kind of perceptions in mind that an operation like intended by the legislature was going to be back of house. It was going to be some place you went and picked up a phone and maybe somebody come, came out and met you and we weren't even sure how it would work to have something actually on the gaming floor. Um, but as you guys, you know, Mark, Marlene, and Teresa, as you rolled this out in our, in, in our team at GameSense, the fact that you took something that could be public facing right next to the gaming floor, and to an extension of that, it's not only outward facing facility, it's the outward facing people. I mean, the fact that you're, you know, it's not just stand behind the counter and hope somebody comes to you, it's going out, it's finding the, the gentleman on the floor who might be in distress, it's kind of, developing these relationships that you see with frequent customers. I mean, that's, that's really what has made, um, that's really what has made the program start or work and be successful. And the fact that you're not also willing to go off site and do some things. And, you know, Marlene, you and I have talked about this as you're rolling out some new engagement strategies. What's the additional awareness you can bring to game sense in our hosts and surrounding communities? So, and to our licensees, you know, we couldn't have done this without their cooperation and help as well. So, congrats to all of you because you're the you're the face of Game Sense and you're making it a success. Yeah, if I could just clarify my initial statement about the the statute, it it kind of scared me when I first read it. I didn't know how to kind of conceptualize it in my head, and um, and I think in the end, it's it was it was broad and that really worked to our advantage and I have to believe that it was probably made broad like that so that we could kind of grow into it the way that that we have so um, yeah it's uh, it was good a groundbreaking to, to require on-site services yeah uh, I have do you have a question commissioner I have a, a, a first up a comment uh, tremendous to have you um, Josh and David here, Ray. We, we're we're more familiar with you, and but yep. of course happy to have you here as well. But how how lucky we are to have um, the two of you here providing um, really good information for us, and then um, doing the service and work that you do. And it it is um, an important profession that you're engaging in. So thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. I know that your team overall are multi um, language skills and uh, do either of you speak another language David <laughs> so uh, it's a bit embarrassing to say that right now I can only speak English fluently but I, I grew up speaking uh, Mandarin Chinese and uh, I also grew up outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands so I used to speak Dutch as well uh, it's my goal in 2020 to polish up on my Mandarin at least mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> make that skill going forward and, and you, Josh? Your English I'm, is excellent. Yes, I'm quite good at English, but that's my specialty. Um, it's, it's, I mean, let's all face it, it's excellent. I do not speak any other languages at the moment, so, but I'd love to learn another. So I just wondered if you encountered um, that as a, ch uh, that there's sufficient resources for you in terms of encountering uh, people on, on the uh, casino floor let me take or, it, or when do you well, if you encounter language uh, barriers yeah, yeah. how do you address them well we do on our staff we have a lot of different languages mm -hmm. spoken um, I just had a um, VSC that was done for a um, Chinese speaking person and speaks Cantonese mm -hmm. and I have uh, Chris Wong on my staff 
who is fluent in Cantonese. And uh, he happened to, he was on vacation at the time, and I had to make a phone call to him to help me communicate, you know, um, and it worked out very well. Um, we also have the resources with um, the casino uh, where this gentleman, before we figured out what was going on, what they were looking for, we actually had to go through a casino host. So I, we know how to find somebody that speaks the language. So we went to Asian Marketing and they helped us out. Um, I also have uh, Egado who um, speaks fluent Spanish. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we do hit a lot of several languages on my team uh, and we're able to communicate. I, Egado helped me immensely with a Spanish speaking person that his mom was forcing him to try to exclude and we're trying to tell her that, I mean, we don't do third party, you can't make him do it and stuff. And Agato was able to help me communicate with them. We were on a three party conference call to do that, you know, and it uh, worked great. Um, but like, yes, like I said, uh, in the casino industry, there are a number of languages spoken there. It's very diverse and uh, it, the staff themselves actually can help us. I mean, we have great relationships with the managers and we can call them and see if somebody can help us in a language that we don't speak amongst my team. So what I'm hearing is it's not, you, you haven't encountered barriers yet, which is the not, not Yeah. Not that we've seen, we haven't seen a barrier, you know, it's like it, we've been able to overcome something. You know? And good luck on that 2020 goal. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. So um, we're going to so swap much. rows right now. Um, and, but as um, especially Lisa and Daniel come up, um, compliance okay. managers at uh, Plain Ridge Park and MGM, um, they're, they're, our relationship with our operators is is instrumental in the success of the program. Um, and uh, um, we really couldn't do it without them. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Tough act afternoon. to follow. Um, we are going to be focusing a bit on our experience this year with Responsible Gaming Education Week. But first, I will introduce um, my team today. So to my right is Charlie Ordilly, who is the senior GSA at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Daniel Miller, Compliance MGM. Lisa McKenney, Compliance Plain Ridge Park Casino. And of course, David Tang, who you just heard from. <laughs> uh, so this will be sorry, this will be our fourth year of participating in Responsible Gaming Education Week, which is a national advocacy week, adv advocacy and awareness week. Um, it was actually held this year for the first time um, in September. It ran from September 16th through 20th. Um, and the themes which we um, gave it this year was have a game plan and watch your time with game sense, both of which are meant to encourage personal control and limit player transition from low risk to higher levels of um, gambling related harm, which you heard a bit about that scale today, so that's a nice segue. Um, I'm going to jump around my page a little bit and talk about some of the outward facing awareness that we did and communication. <clears throat> Um, so in addition to our own um, Game Sense MA social media um, campaign, Plain Ridge Park Casino used their Facebook to post a daily responsible gaming education message. Encore Boston Harbor displayed um, messages on their table game monitors when those table games weren't in use. So it was really cool to see that throughout the floor. And MGM um, actually asked GameSense to host a back of house tabling event, which through our metrics we recorded reached uh, 235 casino staff. So we were really happy with that extra bump in collaboration. Um, we also engaged in paid digital advertising that week, which led to an increase of GameSense MA website visits. Um, interestingly, about half of those vis visitors were um, 60 plus, so a vulnerable population. So we were really happy to see that level of engagement. 
<clears throat> um, in addition to the regular messages that we were putting out, we also launched, we're calling them Game Sense Advisor sports cards. They're meant to look like baseball cards, and um, it introduces the Game Sense Advisor by name, where they work, and a bit about them. Um, so more to come from those, but that was the first week which we launched them. And you can see some examples on your screen and on the paper. Um, <clears throat> and I thought it was something cool to include, even though it wasn't launched specifically for Responsible Gaming Education Week, we still had um, taxi top ads throughout the Boston area um, promoting responsible gaming. And they were still in market during the week. Um, and you can see this is actually my favorite one. If I can read it, gambling with a budget is like wearing a seatbelt. And then it draws the reader to GameSense and then to visit GameSenseMA.com. <clears throat> of course, the most important part of this week was the engagement had with um, casino staff and also guests. Um, metrics and data collection is really, really important to us. Um, and so these numbers highlight this week, but it's just a drop in the hat of all of the engagements that our advisors have. So that week alone, through some incredible um, educational activities, the GameSense advisors across all three properties reached over um, 6,000 patrons. Um, and that would be considered an intensive interaction. So it's a two-way interaction, um, which focuses on responsible or problem gambling. So it speaks a bit, Enrique, to Sorry, Commissioner Zuniger, um, to the quality, <laughs> quality interactions. Um, here to highlight one of our newest um, educational activities is David. Um, and I will say that this activity was created by Amy Gabrella, who is senior GSA at MGM, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but David will do a fantastic job in her place showing it off for you. So I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you very much, Teresa. Right, so it's to my understanding that uh, the commissioners that you each have a piece of paper showing uh, what's displayed on that easel over there, which is a basic overview of the game, which is meant to be a slot simulator. Uh, we have on... Can we get it on the screen? Can, so. can, it, can Should we move that? Or, so that... No? They have it. Oh, they have it. They have it. Good. Got it. Thank you. So on um, one of the panels, we have slot machine simulators, uh, rules, how to play, the technology behind it. Um, you know, the basic premise of the game is to simulate a simple slot machine so that players can get a better understanding of uh, of uh, hit chance, the probabilities, and um, even a little bit about payback percentage, right? So uh, quite simply put, we have three 60-sided dice, all right? Don't ask me where we got them. Amy, Amy found them, <laughs> all right? Um, yep. So they're all different colors to make it easy to distinguish. And for every number on the die, uh, it's associated with a symbol, just like it would be on a slot machine. Okay, so we'd have a patron roll a die, and let's say the first die rolls. It's a terrible roll. Um, let's say <laughs> the first one rolls, and it comes out to be number 40, right? So we would turn to the second page. We would find uh, the number 40. Half the fun is trying to find where it is on the page. Leap um, no. So it comes out as a wild, right? As a many, wild, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many slot machines have wild symbols, uh, which can substitute for any other symbol. If they get three wild symbols, they could pick any two prizes. So in return for the participation in this game, in return for this little bit of education information, uh, we give them some free game sense swag. You know. Uh, so patron then gets to roll the next die and comes out as 28. And if you look at the dollar signs, <coughs> 28 is the symbol for Tumblr, mm -hmm. right? And then we'll roll another one. And the last final die, the final reel, comes out as 48. And 48, unfortunately, uh, comes out as a bell. So that's not a winning combination, in which case the patron has to roll again. Uh, just, to, uh, just to make a, a long story short and to highlight how this translates into um, uh, educating guests with three 60 sided dies there are over now there are 216,000 combinations exactly 216,000 right with the wild symbols right uh, there are a little over 22,000 winning combinations and that 
those are realistic numbers for a slot machine. Right? The only difference with the slot machines, they're working with a far larger pool. But the hit probabilities, hit chances, it's, it's almost the same. Um, you know, most slot machines operate within the range of, you know, 9 to 25%. Obviously, it does vary, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so we would have our patrons roll again, and let's just see how long it takes. If they roll again, they, it's time to get a number four. Uh, four on the chart is a dollar sign, so that's a tumbler. Next one, 37. Comes out to be a wild. And the final one, number five, right, it's a cherry. So they might go like this back and forth a few times, and we tell them, hey, you know, can you imagine how much money you would have spent by now if this was an actual slot machine? You know? So after the third time, if they don't get it, we tell them, hey, feel free to pick a prize. You know, thank you for your participation. And if you ever have any other questions, you want to learn more about slots, feel free to visit GameSense. Any questions? Uh, David, are there um, some slot machines with 60 potential, just like the dice uh, that you have, uh -huh. 60 potential in, in each of the three reels? Mm -hmm. or are there more or more reels? So uh, my understanding is that uh, every slot machine is a little different and that each reel operates on a random number generator. The range for that random number generator um, is set by the company that creates these games, but my understanding is that range is far larger and that the total number of combinations, uh, total possible combinations goes into the millions. What's, uh, what's your experience in, um, as you engage with slot players mm -hmm. uh, on a demonstration like this? Yes. What, uh, what are their comments in general? How do they react to, you know, large numbers like you know you have to multiply 60 times 59 times 58 <laughs> in order to get to whatever the number yes, of permutations. 16,000 yeah. yeah. Uh, no absolutely it's it's really interesting because you get to see people from various different backgrounds. Um, some people a very small portion are um, you know they understand the math and you know they're really drawn to that. A lot of people are um, you know, I guess they're more intuitive players and they say oh you know this is just like playing a slot machine haven't hit haven't hit haven't hit. Right? But it's a different environment where they aren't risking any money. Um, I think that uh, most people, when they come uh, and they approach our center and they approach a game like this, uh, they're coming usually with an open mindset. Um, you know, they have no idea what to expect. You know, some of them come ready to pay money in order to play this game, and we tell them, we tell them hey, no, it's free. You know, <laughs> it's just for education. <laughs> How do, do they um, grasp the concept that every spin is independent of one another, which is a common misconception on slot players. That yeah. You know what, that is probably one of the most pervasive myths surrounding uh, the casino industry and surrounding the casino environment. And a lot of people that we talk to, um, you know, whether we're doing this game or not, whenever we're talking about slots, one of the things that we bring up. And it a lot of times sparks that aha moment where people understand, oh, you know, it doesn't matter how long I've been playing. It doesn't matter if I play on the same machine or a different machine. You know, it, doesn't matter how much money I've already put into it. And you know, I think that's one of the best ways dispelling myths like that, that we can encourage responsible and healthy play. That's a great simulation. Thank you, David. Um, one thing which I would just like to add, which really strikes me as David was going through this activity, is the speed in which you can play an actual slot machine now. It took us a really long time to go through just three rolls. Um, we had to do all the thinking and processing. Now it's, you know, fun. You can go really fast with it. So thank you. Um, representing Plain Ridge Park Casino, I'm going to pass it over to Charlie Ordilly. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon, Charlie. I'm Charlie Ordilly. I'm Senior Game Sense Advisor at Plain Ridge Park. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about RGEW, uh, the success it was at Plain Ridge Park. Uh, Lisa allowed us to have a Outstanding location when you get off the uh, garage elevator right in front of the security booth. It's the uh, first thing you see was our game sense information table. Um, we had signage, you know, keep gaming fun, uh, take a break with game sense. Uh, we did our demos at the table. We also had um, the game sense brochures out for everybody, the BSE, to play my way, the uh, where to get support 
anything that the guests would need. We had a raffle basket out there for the for the week, which we got 775 raffle entries for that five days. Um, again, with uh, Plain Ridge Park, uh, they gave us 500 co-branded co watches that we gave out to the first 100 guests that came to the, uh, the demo table, um, which was very popular. They were waiting for us to open. Where are they? Um, it was, it was <laughs> advertised on the uh, digital. It was advertised in the monthly planner. Um, it was awesome. The, the cooperation that uh, we got from Plain Ridge Park was great. Um, we also had uh, play at SMA at Plain Ridge Park uh, buttons that we gave to all the PPC team members, my team, and any guests that wanted them. So, um, but we did, uh, uh, we kept it fun. We didn't preach to uh, uh, the guests about problem gambling, responsible gambling, but what we, we did was, we did 1,560 demos for that week, for those five days, and uh, come out to about 780 guests that we interacted with. Um, and each of those interactions were probably three to five minutes. Um, and very popular, the 60-sided uh, dice game was one of them. The Game Sense Plinko was, uh, uh, we did some quizzes, the high-low game. But those games, what it was is um, uh, we discussed randomness, uh, the RNG, the, uh, you know, odds, house advantage, uh, different things. Uh, we also had, uh, we gave out four pounds of miniature Kit Kat bars, take a break with Kit Kats. We had our Game Sense uh, uh, stickers on them, and uh, we gave them out to the guests that were playing their slot machines, gave them to employees. Uh, it, was a fun t it was a fun time. Uh, but we also had uh, Game Sense advisors, including myself, that were out there for the people that were, uh, that seen the demonstrations that, but really wanted more, wanted to talk to us about you know, they're gambling, uh, you know, about responsible game, problem gambling, or really just wanted to talk. Um, and we had quite a few of those interactions as well. Um, I know Plain Ridge Park also had a, uh, a table set up in the EDR uh, for their, their employees that uh, they had quizzes and different things. But we, like I said, uh, the employees, they were involved, they had the Kit Kats, they had the buttons, and you know, guests would ask, what's going on over there? And they would bring them to us for the demonstration, to have that conversation. So uh, it was a very successful week. And, uh, it, it, was, it was very good. I was very proud of it. That's great. Impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so from compliance at um, MGM Springfield and of course from Plainish Park Casino, I'll pass it over to Daniel. Thank you, Teresa. Good afternoon, Commissioners, late Lady Chair. Um, so I, <laughs> I consider myself a bit of a latecomer to the party that's uh, re, uh, responsible gaming education week because I'd only been in my current position two weeks uh, when it was due to start. Um, and so that week had kind of almost passed by the time it had come to me. Um, about all the stories of my counterparts at other MGM properties, um, because you may or may not know that we've actually partnered with GameSense across all of our domestic MGM properties, um, that they were hosting similar events. Um, so I immediately got on the phone to Amy Gabrilla, uh, you know, the creator of this game, that David has, has just uh, demonstrated for us, and said, is there a, a chance that you and I and maybe a couple of your other GameSense advisors could do something the following week? And she said, of course. And I said, right, well, we'll rebrand it. It's going to be Responsible Gaming Education Week 2.0. <laughs> and so the following week, we set aside two four-hour uh, sessions uh, on the Friday and the Saturday. We did set up a table in our um, EDR session, our employee dining room. Uh, and I was there with them. Um, and we played this game. And the, the main thing that I drew away from it that amazed me more than anything was, one, the enthusiasm of the employees for the, the game itself and understanding it. And two, was the learning that was going on. Um, because we touched so many different employees from different parts of, of the property, um, those that are slot techs, those that are uh, gaming oriented, kind of had an idea, but those that are working as our housekeepers, custodial facilities didn't, they got to feel like they were part of that fun too. And because they're still out there on the floor, I think now they're better armed to just you know see or notice someone uh, and maybe help out too. So. 
that um, what, what I will be doing um, with our uh, on-site game sense going forward is setting up more frequent uh, participation in responsible gaming events back of house. Good afternoon, commissioners, lady chair. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, we are, for our Responsible Gaming Education Week at Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, we focus, I focus internally on our employees. And so um, we sent out daily communications through email. And I'll let you know we did separate topics each day based on Responsible Gaming. The first day we did um, advertise Penn National Daily Commitment to Responsible Gaming and Responsible Gaming programs. and. Day two, we um, had the topic of three types of gamblers, recreational, problem, and compulsive. Day three topic was underage persons and unattended man minors. Day four topic was responsible alcohol service. And day five was self-exclusion, voluntary self-exclusion. So we had um, posters on a back of house communication board where everybody could see it. We had a responsible gaming board um, for the week. So the posters advertised the topics for each day. All the topics were pre-shifted on every shift each day. And employees, as I believe Charlie mentioned, we did daily quizzes based off of these topics. Each day we pulled um, the Team members who answered correctly were entered into drawings and we um, issued um, three winners per day, received $25 gift cards to Dunkin' Donuts. And then in addition to all of the communication throughout the week, we launched our required annual um, responsible gaming training for our team members. And for those who successfully, successfully completed their training during the week, were entered into a drawing to win gift cards. So um, we had a lot of participation from our um, team members, and the week went off pretty well, actually. And it, it was this was a good responsible gaming education week for us mm -hmm. this year. That's great. Wow. Thank you. It's good yeah. To hear. Thank you all. Really impressive work. And I do like the partnerships. Really, <coughs> that just makes it so much stronger. Yeah, it makes it easier for us when we can split and have Game Sense focus on our guests, and then we can focus internally. And then our marketing team also had social media every day, so our employees could see it as well as our guests. So it was very nice to have that. The other thing that worries me, though, is that they've kind of set the bar that much higher, so next year I've got to try and <laughs> exceed that. So. Healthy competition. Yeah, that, and that's why uh, Commissioner Cameron likes it. She likes that competition. It feeds it. And I think that um, there, that she was a recipient of one of my handwritten notes. Am I right, Teresa? Yeah, yeah she was. So um, it's a, why don't you explain what the, the quarterly um, Game Sense, it's um, Game Sense Excellence yes. Award. Sure. So um, on a quarterly basis, we have the Game Sense Advisors um, choose three casino staff members who exemplify or incorporate responsible gaming into their daily role. Um, and those individuals are typically identified in some sort of internal communication. They're also presented with a handwritten thank you note from the chair, um, as well as a small gift card just to show our appreciation because they really do um, impact the work that we do on the floor. And, and what I love about that program is that it's the Game Sense advisors who recognize how important the partnership is and they look for the positive attributes that they need for their success through you. So congratulations again in person. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you and Thank happy you. holidays. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Happy holidays. We're very excited to have you as part of our right before the holiday uh, meeting. So it's such positive news. Thanks. Um, so we're on um, item number nine, um, Budsman Ziemba. 
And we've got, is Mary here? Um, we've got Joe Delaney and Jill Griffin, and maybe Mary will join. No? I think Mary's upstairs. I don't think she's joining us today. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Ooh. Ooh. Josh, thanks it's again. An old joke, but a good Nobody one. noticed you. <laughs> Off to repeat it. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Commissioners. Up for consideration today are two amendments to community mitigation fund awards that were made earlier this year. Uh, I'm first going to turn to Joe Delaney uh, for a very brief description of one minor amendment to the Revere uh, Non Transportation Planning Award. And then after the Commission considers that award amendment, we will then turn to Director Griffin for a description of the requested amendment to uh, an award to the Massachusetts uh, Casino Career uh, Team Institute. I, I think I missed that one word. But uh, what training, thank you. My writing's not very um, legible. Um, the Commission approved a very similar amendment earlier this year, so hopefully some of the concepts of this amendment are familiar, but let me turn it over briefly to Joe. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioners. Um, in 2019, the City of Revere received a uh, $50,000 grant uh, from the Community Mitigation Fund, um, and its purpose was to develop a, a, a video that would uh, uh, promote the City of Revere as a tourist destination, um, and that also included money uh, for promoting that, getting it in the local hotels and other things of that nature. Um, as it turns out, um, the city spent, a, they were supposed to spend about 40000 on the video, 10000 on promotion. They spent about 35000 on developing the video. Apparently they had a number of festivals and fairs and other things where they were able to just get footage that they could use for that rather than having to hire someone to go out and get it. And um, so what they're hoping to do is take that 5000 they saved there and put it towards the promotion uh, budget. Uh, apparently there's about 900 hotel rooms in the development pipeline in Revere that they would like to coordinate with. Some of those are coming online a little bit sooner than they expected. So uh, we reviewed the application and it certainly seems uh, reasonable uh, for this uh, transfer and we re recommend uh, that that be done. Any questions? No questions. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the Commission approved the request to modify the 2019 City of Revere non-transportation planning grant and reduce the production cost to $35,000 with a commensurate increase in the marketing and distribution budget to $15,000 as discussed today. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. So without further delay, let me turn to Director Griffin for the second item. Good afternoon again. Um, uh, in uh, the Commission's 2019 grant to Holyoke Community College, um, 50,000 of that grant was dedicated to scholarships for the gaming school. Holyoke Community College has requested an amendment um, for some of those funds for the Mass Casino Careers Training Institute. Um, which will allow them to cover the cost of gaming instructors and recruitment coordinators for two courses that they plan to offer in January, a day and evening course. Um, in the case that those two courses are um, low enrolled, um, it would allow them to offer the courses um, if they have less than 10 employees. Um, we have um, spoken with both the grantee and our licensee. Um, MGM supports this amendment um, as the running of these classes will help to enhance their pool of qualified <coughs> applicants. Um, and anything else? Yeah, I think that's it. Do we have um, any questions? I think at some point uh, I, I would love to revisit just this program. I understand the request that's before us, but it's just so vital to the underlying goals for the workforce development. So we can turn to that issue, broader that, issue. Later. I, I can add that part of our discussion with the licensee um, involves a, a 
a meeting regarding um, recruitment, mm -hmm. um, and um, we're all interested in, in making sure that this is a successful program. And we can certainly update you following our discussion and, and those meetings. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Motion? So, no. Madam Chair, I move the Commission authorize staff to approve the request to reallocate $15,000 from the Massachusetts Casino Career Training Institute scholarship budget to cover the cost of gaming instructors and recruitment coordinators for two courses in January of 2020, allowing for more flexible enrollment. Second. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to uh, make a small point. Maybe I've made it before. Um, I, I, I really appreciate these, these updates. They don't take too much uh, of the agenda, and, and, and it's really good to keep tabs of how um, serious the program is taken by not just you, but especially the people that we grant uh, uh, these grants to. to. Um, but I would like us to think about um, perhaps a de minimis threshold under which some of these requests might not need to come to us, could, could, could be approved at the staff level. Um, I don't know what that threshold might be, uh, but it just, it just feels, sorry, it just feels like uh, under some amount, especially if it's moving money between one line and another that's already been considered should really be done uh, uh, perhaps more efficiently and timely by, by the staff and then come back and report to the commission when necessary. Um, so Commissioner, that's a great suggestion. One thing I'll bring to the commission is in the 2020 guidelines, we included a threshold which uh, provided staff approval for items. Uh, we worked that out between uh, uh, various commissioners had different thresholds. We meshed them all together, but we didn't get, we didn't seek that vote for this current year. But we could do that for the remainder oh, no, of no, the year. Oh no, no, that's great. We so we can bring that for uh, maybe approval of the next meeting to allow us to do that for the remainder of this program year. It's if we're addressing through the guidelines. I think that's. I was thinking more in the longer term, and yeah. if we're already um, doing it through the guidelines. I'm satisfied. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so, commissioners, my, uh, my next item is uh, an appointment. Earlier this year, the commission voted to approve Director Vander Linen, uh, if you can join me, uh, to the subcommittee of addiction services under the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee. We've been very, working very hard to activate this subcommittee. Um, as you're aware, Commissioner Zuniga and Mark Vander Linen have been uh, very involved in the subject matter of this subcommittee. Uh, Commissioner Z Zuniga, um, Given his role and uh, his historic work on, on the subject matter, Mark and I both recommend that the commissioner appoint that the commission appoint Commissioner Zuniga uh, as this appointee replacing Mark. Uh, both Mark and I would continue to staff uh, the, this subcommittee, and um, Mark is going to give you a little bit of detail about what we're trying to do to get the remaining members uh, of the subcommittee up and running so that we can begin the, the, the hard work of this of this subcommittee. Um, hello, again. <laughs> um, so uh, we are, as, as um, Ombudsman Ziemba said, we are working hard to activate the subcommittee. Um, it's our goal to, to have our first meeting as soon as possible. Um, we have made some progress in, in determining the, the um, individuals that will um, sit on this important committee. Um, the, uh, um, as it states in um, the section 68 of 23K, um, the committee shall be five members, one of whom shall be um, from the Department of Public Health's Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. Um, for that role, um, they have a appointed um, Deirdre Calvert. And just real quick, uh, a couple of notes about Deirdre. Um, she's a licensed clinical social worker with an MSW from Boston University. Um, she has more than 25 years experience in substance addiction treatment and co-occurring illnesses. She's currently the um, director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, so she's, she's quite qualified. Um, another individual, um, as stated in Section 68, shall be from a representative from the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling. 
um, for that role Marlene Warner um, is going to fill. Uh, Marlene has been with the council since 2001 um, and as a de executive director since 2011. Um, she's during this entire tenure advocated for policies and provisions to keep gambling safe, healthy, and to provide services for those negatively impacted by ga gambling disorder. Um, she, uh, she, she builds connections to treatment facilities, recovery directed policies and uses evidence-based research to lobby for increased supports and funding for responsible and problem gambling research and programs. Um, there are two uh, members who would be identified by the governor's office. Um, we are working with the governor's office to, to um, identify those, those individuals. Um, as that is also a process and we're, we're <coughs> actively and willingly engaged in that. Um, so as, as uh, Ombudsman Ziemba said, um, I respectfully request that, that we um, change the um, commission appointment from myself to Commissioner Zerniga. And, and perhaps I should mention, uh, you know, something you mentioned quickly, uh, John, and that is, um, there's a staffing that is required or needed uh, as part of these um, uh, these kinds of committees, uh, and, and and in that capacity, uh, Mark can can be perhaps a little bit more um, focused on, on 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 that piece. And this committee will report to GPAC, correct, John? That's a structure under the statute. It, yes, it's one of the subcommittees, the GPAC. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It just has never been activated, and at this point in time, it's really important for it to be activated in order to get more and more expertise to the um, to the stakeholders. So, I think that uh, this I would recommend this change. I think it's an important for our overall makeup of this of this um, committee. This, uh, we were lucky that we had we have two very um, Good choices, and I think this probably optimizes those uh, the expertise that we can deliver through your staffing yeah. in in your membership. Thank you. So, do I have a motion? I, um, <clears throat> on. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I move the commission appoint Commissioner Enrique Zuniga to the subcommittee on addiction services of the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee (GPAC), transferring the appointment formally given to uh, from Mark Van Mark Van Second. Second. Bruce, it's yours. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 We didn't ask. I'll abstain we? and thank you for your vote of confidence. It's a 20 year appointment. 4 1. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yes. thank you, um, Enrique, Commissioner Zuniga, for agreeing to do that. Thank you. Now we are moving on um, to item 11. I want to point out that we do have a matter under item 13 that we will um, want to address today as well. So, um, <clears throat> Commissioner items, I guess we'll turn to the annual report. Commissioner Zuniga. Th thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, the This is a brief update um, only to report that the latest draft of the uh, annual report was included in the packet um, the, the meeting before, the, um, two weeks ago. Um, it is uh, drafted for review and uh, final input from, uh, from the members of uh, the commission. It's already gone uh, into editing mode with um, the, the, uh, the careful leadership of um, our communications director Elaine and our vendor Jack Rabbit to try to put together the the graphics that are fresher and etc. Um, we did not include it in the packet again, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any, or just report that uh, we're working towards uh, finalizing it uh, so that we can uh, distribute it early uh, in the new year. So, um, 
once again, I just I really want to thank uh, Commissioner Zuniga for taking the lead on this. It's not an easy thing to do every year. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of prodding to get all the information you need to complete the report. It's always very professionally done. It's it's a really um, an excellent work product. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. It's a little uh, later than we wished for, but uh, we are complying with getting it done, and and and. That's mm -hmm. the main reason of mm -hmm. um, the update. Mm -hmm. All set. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Commissioner Cameron, you want to update us on your matter? Yeah, you know, I, um, I mentioned it at a meeting, I think it was a couple of meetings ago, that I really wanted to um, take a look at the uh, GEU overtime and just if there was a way I could be helpful uh, because I've had experience with these matters and um, just to have a full understanding of the issues. So if I can report to my fellow commissioners that I did meet with uh, IEB leadership in order to have a better understanding. And what I, um, what I learned was there really are four different pots for overtime. Um, and the first one are details uh, for memoir. And these are um, paid for directly by the, um, by the club and they are put out as all state police uh, overtime details are, um, and they are not, they are filled by the appropriate um, policies and procedures followed by the state police. And again, there is no impact to the uh, gaming enforcement unit's budget on that matter. Secondly, there are special events, and for an example would be uh, Murphy's Boxing, and this is very similar, it is filled by, um, non-gaming enforcement members from Everett PD as well as uh, MSP and it's paid for separately by Encore Boston Harbor and again there is no impact on the GEU budget. Um, the third pot or bucket is the um, overtime for uniform security. There are certain times that um, EBH has requested uniform coverage some of their busier times, they have, uh, they have requested that coverage. Um, this is filled by our GEU members. They have the experience, they know the operation, they're the best ones to work for uh, this, this uh, detail. And that is paid for directly by uh, Encore Boston Harbor. And again, no, um, there is no impact to the gaming enforcement unit budget. And the fourth category is uh, MGC authorized overtime. And that is for all three casinos. And what we're talking about there are um, minimum staffing levels, investigations, arrest, court time. Uh, but the majority is really shift staffing levels. And I needed to, or wanted to understand better what they, um, how they were making those decisions. I, actually was, was very satisfied to learn that um, they really are looking at data and um, risk analysis to judge that staffing and it continues, right? As we, uh, as we learn what um, at each three casino what the issues have been and where the risk is, they are staffing accordingly um, and, they're, and, and it's, it's managed and tracked appropriately. Um, Actually, it's been a long time since I've uh, spoken to uh, public safety personnel that take this matter very seriously and are really managing, tracking, and, um, and making sure those, uh, those costs are appropriate. So for my review, I, I believe that uh, we are uh, managing this issue and uh, it's, it's appropriately staffed. Thank you for uh, getting back to us on that. It was important work to, to go over, and we appreciate your input too, Derek, on that. Any questions for Commissioner Cameron? Thank you. No, that's a very uh, good summary. I um, Just just a, a, a question. The first, uh, it appears the first three instances, the sp special events, uh, memoir, and, and special requests, um, it, um, does that act, is that actually uh, current uh, members of the unit that have an opportunity for overtime, or is it other members outside of the unit that it's, come in? 
on a, on an ad hoc basis. Yes, there's the uh, the appropriate procedures in place with both uh, Everett PD and MSP for uh, overtime details. They're put out, and everyone has a chance to bid. Mm -hmm. um, so those uh, procedures are being utilized, and and typically these positions are filled by outside members of. Mm -hmm those two, uh, those agencies. Right. Great. Any further questions for Commissioner Cameron? The, the only question I had is I participated in at least one of the conversations on this. There was some question in terms of the numbers that we had gotten from Derek in terms of whether this was accurately reflected or not. I just oh. wanted to make sure everything is. We did update that in our did last Did we update meeting. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah so, in the, so in the last meeting, um, out of the four items that Commissioner Cameron talked about, the numbers that I gave to you, Items one and two are not included in that. Items three and four are. Okay. Um, but we made a decision at that meeting that we would bill directly for item number three. We just sent out the bill earlier this week for 108,000 to Encore Boston Harbor to reimburse um, us for that amount. Um, but item four continues to be the largest of the uh, of the mm -hmm. things that we have control over. Correct. Mm -hmm. and shared. Correct. Which. Um, as, as Commissioner Cameron has um, detailed, she's done a very thorough dive into it, um, has worked very hard with the uh, Gaming Enforcement Unit to figure out what we can do to kind of manage that going forward. But through the conversation, staffing numbers are appropriate, mm -hmm. so we are probably going to need some extra money in that throughout the year. Um, they're trying to contain it so it doesn't continue to grow at the rate it is, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to you know, we have four months through the year and about close to 50% spent, it's hard, going to be hard to come in on that first so number. I think that most of I know The piece I wanted to mention with regard to that is this is overtime, yes. but there are um, personnel who have left, so those salaries are not uh, coming to us. In other words, when you're a full-time member of the unit, that's that salary is paid for by the Gaming Commission. So although the overtime may be maybe higher the uh, the salary there's some offsets yes there are good word there are offsets there and and that has to be tracked too though because lots of times the overtime Time. will be Exceed. it's more effective to just put another full-time person in right. rather than overtime so we're really closely looking at that sometimes there's a delay in um, you know state police have um, uh, all of the PDs have staffing issues so we may not always be able to get an additional uh, person when we think it's appropriate, so thus some overtime. But the main um, bottom line is that Commissioner Cameron was very pleased with Detective Lieutenant Connor's analysis and, and how he is uh, uh, analyzing the staffing needs. Correct, yes. And, and Stay tuned in terms of whether or not he continues with the overtime versus fulfilling Full the other, um, at, at yes. least maybe one, if not the two. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I, I am I'm very pleased that you're looking it, into that. I, I, I'm also um, very encouraged that uh, you mentioned that it's something that we should look at uh, periodically or, or you know, uh, continuously. Um, only because there is, at least in other, historically, in other agencies around the country, uh, has been the, you know, the perverse incentives for some overtime to become a baseline and, and grow from there. And uh, it requires, uh, uh, I believe, the, you know, the, the, the good analysis and watchful eye uh, at, on a periodic basis to think critically and, and, and make those, uh, those adjustments if necessary or, or continue, you know, because they're appropriate. I agree. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to number 12, uh, Derek and uh, Todd and um, Commissioner O'Brien, I asked for you to review a request that was made uh, regarding Commissioner uh, Cameron's pay. I will be recusing myself. Um, Madam Chair, I will recuse and I'll actually step out of the room as well since this item does um, does um, refer to something that commissioners will will talk about that concerns me. So recusal, and I'll step out. Thank you. And we'll invite you back for item 13. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, I'll have you lead. Thanks. 
Just wait till the door actually closes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want your tea, Gail? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, th this item is on the agenda um, at the request of um, Commissioner Cameron, I think to some extent Executive Director Bedrosian in terms of um, just finishing a vote, essentially an extension of a vote that the three of us took at the time when Chair Crosby resigned back in September of 18, where the Commission was left needing um, to determine who would be chair and who would serve in that function. And there was unanimity amongst us at the time that Commissioner Cameron be that person. Uh, I can speak for myself, um, not, not for you obviously, that at the time I uh, anticipated and hoped she would take uh, the responsibility, authority, and any benefits that went with. And it seems to me she did the former and not the latter, apparently. And then there is one portion of the benefits that we need to address. Um, the question was whether there was any legal impediment or process, et cetera, that would be necessary. And I will defer briefly to Attorney Grossman in terms of um, an analogous case he's located uh, that I think addresses what we're asking. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, it, it is my opinion that uh, Commissioner Cameron can be compensated for her service as interim chair as a matter of law and as a matter of equity, of course. There is legal authority that supports the proposition that an interim appointment uh, by an authorized individual or entity is legally valid even if the process that was used to obtain that appointment would not necessarily pass muster had the appointment been intended as a permanent one. Uh, the authority for that proposition stems from a 1986 a SJC case uh, that is captioned Appley versus Locke. The citation is 396 Mass 540. That was a case that involved the interim appointment of the chair and CEO of the MBTA as it was constituted at the time. By statute, that appointment was made by the governor but had to be approved by an advisory board. In the case uh, there, uh, the gentleman was appointed on an interim basis by the governor but was never um, uh, signed off by that advisory board as the statute required. But the case arose because that interim CEO went on to terminate the employment of two MBTA uh, employees who then challenged uh, his authority to take that particular action. The SJC ultimately uh, heard the case and held that the CEO in that matter did in fact have legal authority to act in that situation. The court relied on the fact that the appointment was of an interim nature and that nobody was claiming otherwise. And that importantly, it was clear that the MBTA in that situation could not function for any significant period of time on a day-to-day -day basis without the leadership of a person in that particular position. Therefore, the court uh, held specifically that it's reasonable to conclude that the interim designation of such a person by the governor carried out the intent of the legislature under their enabling uh, laws. Therefore, the interim CEO in, in that particular case was deemed to have the legal authority to exercise the powers of the office. That particular case parallels our particular our situation here where Commissioner Cameron was appointed by the commission to serve in an interim capacity as the chair. The appointment was clearly on an interim basis. There was never any question about that, though there certainly is a provision of Chapter 23K that requires the chair to be designated by the governor on a full-time basis. So certainly the commission, as it knew at the time, could not designate a, a full-time chair, and it did not do that. Um, the appointment was made, however, by the a body, the Gaming Commission, that has a clear statutory oversight over the organization. Chapter 23K uh, is clear on that point that the commission shall all have all powers necessary or convenient to carry out and effectuate its purposes, and that's what it did in this particular case. It was determined, ultimately, that there was a need uh, to ensure that someone sat in that chair position while a permanent chair was being appointed by the governor. Therefore, it's my op opinion that the interim appointment of Commissioner Cameron in this case was lawful and that Commissioner Cameron had the authority to exercise the powers of that office. It follows then, in my opinion, 
that she should be entitled to the statutory compensation that is assigned to the position. Um, so that's, that's my position on this matter. I'm happy to, to take any questions or discuss. Um, th thank you for, for that analysis. Like, like you uh, well articulated initially, Commissioner O'Brien, I, um, I remember that time and I, uh, I thought it was assumed that uh, with, with the additional responsibilities or the uniqueness of that role came the, the benefits, and in this case, compensation differential that the statute also highlights between the commissioners and the chair. Um, at, at the time, we, we did not make that explicit, mm -hmm. and perhaps that's the main reason we, we now find ourselves uh, you know, discussing here, but it's, it's, good, it's good to that be better late than, uh, than, than never. Um, I also would point out that um, even though it's fundamentally, it's a little different, uh, in our practice, um, we have done uh, something similar on uh, other administrative positions. When we have had uh, a, an interim executive director, when we had had um, a CIO uh, that has left and somebody else taken his um, uh, responsibilities, um, and um, and in the in the case of it should be done on on other um, interim positions with additional responsibilities, it's only uh, fair, in, in my opinion as well, that those um, compensation differentials be um, considered, uh, at least for that interim um, period. So um, again, even though those other instances technically fall under the executive director's discretion, um, we have had it for the executive director role um, in which we um, we also agreed and, and conducted that practice. So there's, it only uh, stands to reason that we would be also consistent in, that, in, in this case. Yeah, I thank the, uh, the team for the due diligence they did. Uh, again, I joined my colleagues in, in uh, reflecting on the fact that uh, uh, the appointment was interim, but inherent in that was, I think, how we mirrored uh, our overall HR policy when uh, somebody has been named an interim position. Um, uh, it was certainly a unique situation we found ourselves in, and uh, I think it required us to make you take, maybe take some steps that uh, we hadn't anticipated, but um, hopefully we don't find ourselves in that position again. Uh, but uh, I, I do join with my colleagues and kind of supporting the overall notion that I think we all had uh, at the time of the interim appointment. Mm -hmm. so, just I to just want to add a few things. We did this also with the raising director, general counsel, and senior revenue accountant as well, in addition to the other positions that Enrique said. And um, I do apologize for the uncomfortableness of this um, discussion because it was my mistake not to actually increase her pay at that time period. Um, so if I had just done that at the time, uh, it wasn't until about a month after um, that we realized it hadn't happened. And at that point, we just said, why don't we wait until a new chair and then we'll do a lump sum. So I do apologize for not instructing Troop D to do this. And we actually have to have this conversation. So. It's informative. <laughs> <laughs> Attorney Grossman and I talked about the case. I reviewed the case. and. Um, on a fundamental level in terms of what the expectation was when I voted in addition to the review of the case, I would agree that it fits not only within, you know, the law, but also the intent of the vote, that she have all the benefits and responsibilities, so. Sounds like a consensus. Do we need a mm -hmm. vote uh, We need this? a vote. Yeah. It's, it's uh, I'd move that the commission approve retroactive pay in the amount of $15,531.15 for Commissioner Gail Cameron as compensation for her perf uh, performance as interim chair for pay periods from September 30th, 2018 through January 19th of 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Looks like it's a three and a And one. one up no, no, there's no, there's two. 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 Motion carries 3-0.
Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Troy. Moving on to item number 13. Commissioner Cameron has rejoined us. And um, Mr. Grossman has brought to my attention um, an issue that relates to regulations that we recently approved. And I'll have Todd go through the regulations. But apparently, there was just a, an inadvertent oversight around the posting. Um, on the um, Massachusetts register that's required. I can assure you that on our end, all of our work was complete, and these things just simply happen. It's a lot, a lot of postings that have to take place, but our work was complete. Um, that means that the regulations which we approved are not legally valid. Todd has recommended, and I'm um, prepared to support this, barring some um, argument that I haven't thought about, that we adopt by emergency the changes that we've already approved. And then <coughs> that will allow them to go into effect immediately. And then it does mean we'll have to move through the promulgation process um, once again, which will include a public hearing. Bruce, you did the um, public hearing last time. There were no comments that were uh, received at the first round. <coughs> we're going to do it. We would do an extra special um, around, but the timing of the effectiveness would basically have been the same. Do um, you want to go through which regulations they are? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. And um, thank you, and, Madam oh, Chair. And I should just clarify yeah. this is under number 13. We, I couldn't have reasonably anticipated this. This matter came to light. You, as a team, worked on a solution and came to me late yesterday. So. That's right, and I, I would just reiterate what the chair already said. You have already reviewed these regulations. They went through a public hearing presided over by Commissioner Stebbins. You voted to adopt them in a public uh, hearing uh, two or four weeks ago. I can't remember which. Uh, they've been fully vetted. It was only after the fact that we learned there had been an administrative issue with them. So it was recommended actually by the secretary's office, and I support that, um, that we uh, adopt them by emergency now. They would have been in effect probably by now anyway. So they'll go into effect. Uh, and then we'll just go through the public process again, even though we've already gone through it. The law requires the, that the initial hearing notice be published in the Massachusetts Register, which it wasn't, which somewhat taints the whole rest of the process. Um, so this is the cleanest way just to make sure there isn't any issue uh, with these regulations, which again were non-controversial, we didn't receive any. They're important, but they, we didn't receive any public comment or anything like that. And just to recap, to refresh your recollections as to what we're talking about, the first was an amendment to uh, 205 CMR 133.05 that pertained to the voluntary self-exclusion list and maintenance and distribution of the list. That a particular amendment would have permitted or would permit licensees to provide an aggregated no marketing list to junket operators that will include individuals on the voluntary self-exclusion list but will not identify those people as being on the list. So this was part of our suite of changes involving junket operators and what have you. We needed to uh, match it up uh, with our VSE uh, regulations so there was a tweak that we made in there to ensure essentially that those people aren't marketed to. Uh, once they are um, on the VSC list. The junket operators wouldn't send them uh, marketing materials. The second set of amendments were all to uh, Section 134. Those are, of course, the employee, vendor, and junket uh, regulations. These amendments do a wide variety um, of things. I'll run through really quickly what they do, uh, just again to refresh, attempt to refresh your recollections. Uh, these. Uh, amongst other things, define the process and standards that govern uh, gaming employee licensing procedure, updated elements of the appeal process, uh, added a requirement for the fingerprinting procedure, clarified the procedure for administrative closure of an application, 
uh, required independently operating junket representatives to be licensed as key gaming employee standards, um, and codified licensing and reporting requirement re and restrictions for the junket operators themselves. Um, as, as in addition to adding uh, the waiting period to reapply for a gaming uh, license in the event that an individual was denied um, at some point. So those are, it's 133.05, 133.04, 06, 07, 09, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 20. Those are the section numbers that accompany the uh, uh, provisions I just mentioned. So as uh, the chair mentioned, there was a public hearing on November 21st uh, that preceded your public meeting at which you voted uh, to approve. Um, and again, they've gone through the entire process. They've uh, been published in the newspaper. Uh, you had a public hearing. You voted on these in public, uh, but now we're just recommending they be adopted by emergency, and then we'll bring them back through the process again. Uh, Todd, um, if memory serves me well, these these are the only uh, set of recent regulations that we have uh, that have gone through the whole promulgation process. Is that correct? I think this is the most recent. The set? most recent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Set. Right. Yeah. So. The um, immediate fix would be to uh, allow uh, Mr. Grossman to proceed with the emergency regulation process. That's right. So basically, uh, with your approval, we would file these emerg uh, regulations by emergency. So once you vote on them, they would become effective. We'd file them with the secretary's office uh, today, tomorrow, or Monday. Um, and then we would begin by filing a notice of a public hearing and at some point in the future, probably two months out, um, and have another public hearing and, and that whole thing. And that's a similar process whenever we adopt anything by Same exact regulation. process. That's right. Mm -hmm. it's the only difference here. What's, what's, remind me the time frame for a emergency. It's, only, it's got a shelf life of only so 90, long. Days. 90 days. You have to go through the whole process within 90 days, okay. which we can easily do here. Do I have a motion? Um, right, well, I'm sorry, did you have another question? No, it question? sounds appropriate. The, the it just was a, it's a housekeeping yes. error. You it's know, really yes. an administrative right. matter, yeah. Yeah, and these things happen, and then we've got a remedy here, in this case, without compromising really process, just redundancy, right? That's right. Did anybody catch all the name, all the numbers? <laughs> yeah, those well, regulations? here, if you want to refer to them all, they're right here. <laughs> you could uh, reference them. No, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I move the commission uh, uh, adopt uh, following regulations on an emergency basis, uh, 205 CMR 133.05, 134.01, 0.06, 0.07, 0.09, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 1.3, and 0.20. Uh, sub, uh, uh, with the official uh, regulation promulgation process to uh, be commenced. Second. Any further questions? Thank you, Todd, for bringing that to my attention. Uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mary Ann, we did so well. The conclusion of the meeting was timed out. First time for Mary Ann, 355. And we are concluding at 348. So thank you. You've learned from the best. Do I have a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.